Good evening. In compliance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, I call to order an information session meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Austin Independent School District for Thursday, June 9th, 2022 at 7.06 p.m. A quorum of the board is physically, physically present at AISD Central Office along with two Board of Trustees members joining us via Zoom to conduct this meeting. In addition, some staff and guests will be joining us by video. Board meetings are open to the public based on space availability to ensure social distancing and the health and safety of our community and staff. I will note that about an hour ago, the Travis County's community level has been elevated to medium. And this means that masking is encouraged when social distancing is not possible for those who are up to date on their vaccines and those who are considered at risk should mask when gathering, dining, or shopping. This meeting is streaming live on AISD TV and Apple TV. It's also being broadcast on cable channel 22 through Spectrum, Grande, and on channel 99 and through AT&T UVerse. Closed captioning in English is available on these platforms for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And to our audience tuning in remotely and to those here in person, welcome and thank you for joining us. We will now move to the approval of the agenda. Trustee Boswell, do you have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Having a motion by Trustee Boswell and a second by Trustee Anderson to approve the agenda, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes by all those on the dais. Trustee Boswell, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas Flag? of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Next is an opportunity for the public to share comments with the board. This time allows speakers to comment publicly on any topic of their choosing. As we move into public comment, I wanna make a point of privilege to address technical issues staff is researching. The board and staff wish to apologize to Addison McKenna and other callers who may have experienced leaving a message, but that message did not come up in our system. We want to ensure that the public has a clear and easy process for addressing the board and we take these concerns seriously. Staff is reviewing the system we currently use, which allows for recorded messages instead of only being able to come in person to ensure it is working as intended. We wanna confirm that the district plays all messages it sees in the system that aligns to the public comment policy based on the order they come in. As required by law, we also continue to allow the public to address the board in person during regular voting meetings. And tonight we have time for up to 60 speakers. And as a reminder, the district continues to provide time during the regular voting meetings of the board to hear from the public about agenda items for consideration and vote. This is an opportunity for the board to take part in active listening. And while we wish we could respond or provide feedback, we are required to limit our questions to requests for clarification or follow-up directly to the administration. Members of the public wishing to participate in the public comment portion of our meeting called the dedicated AISD phone line in advance of the meeting to audio record their remarks. We will now play the recorded messages for public comment, so please listen carefully. Hello, I am Heidi Langan, music teacher at Galindo Elementary and president of Austin A2PE. I am speaking to express my strong opposition to the proposed redesign of essential areas. I emailed each of you on Tuesday, and I hope you will take the time to read that email. Our current system, a three-day rotation of music, art, and PE works. It is safe and equitable. Nothing in the new plan will meet that standard. Each school is being asked to create their own schedule and figure out where to have these additional PE classes. This plan will lower the quality of our programs and will be unsafe for our students. It will not be equitable between campuses. I would like to see one of these three options taken by the board. 
Drop the redesign proposal completely. Keep the equitable three-day rotation that has been in place for decades. Or pause beginning the proposed redesign for at least one year so that all of the equity and safety issues can be addressed. If these issues still exist, drop the proposal. Or try the proposal in a limited number of schools this next year. If it is successful, begin it the following year. If it is not successful, drop the proposal. Thank you for your service to AISD and your attention to this important issue. Good evening, Dr. Elizalde and Board of Trustees. My name is Megan Vasquez, and I'm a PE teacher, APER president, and education office member. This essential areas redesign proposal has not yet passed, but many of my PE colleagues have already resigned, retired, or transferred to other districts, so I will see them for more than classroom teacher planning. Decades of experience left our district, and that is just the beginning of the collateral. If this proposal gets passed, our AISD students will ultimately pay the price. Our current essential areas plan is uniform campus to campus. With this essential areas plan, we are creating an unorganized district of schools instead of a unified school district. 50 out of 78 schools will be getting less music and art. Some of our ASD teachers will have grade levels as big as 175. We let you know our gyms were not made to accommodate entire grade levels and that student safety is at risk. Imagine if we stack other areas like PE. We have 37 elementary schools. That's 48 percent allocated one certified math teacher and tasked them to teach grade level classes daily. And when they share concerns about class sizes, we give them extra TAs who aren't certified or responsible for helping them lesson plan or grade. Dr. Elizalde is leading and will not be held accountable for the chaos that will ensue. Please let's work together to create a plan and budget that reflects our district priorities. Our students deserve an education that is safe, inclusive, equitable, and whole child focused. Do not approve the essential areas budget line item. A plan like that should be saving us money, not costing us $8 million more. My name is Addison McKenna, and I'm a student at the Liberal Arts and Science Academy. I am calling in support of a human sexuality and responsibility curriculum. I'd like to thank the staff and volunteers who have put in countless hours of work to create a curriculum that teaches students the importance of healthy relationships, to respect their bodies, and by teaching students to use appropriate terminology to help protect children from potential abuse. As an LGBTQIA plus student, I appreciate the language you use to include students who may not identify as their assigned gender. I would also like to take a moment to thank the trustees for taking the time to meet with students and working with us this year. I'm very appreciative of the addition of preferred pronoun usage to the student code of conduct. Thank you for working to create a more accepting and inclusive environment for students in this district. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Lisa Lim, Board of Trustees. My name is George Shaw and I'm the PE teacher at Pleasant Hill Elementary and proud member of APER and Education Austin. I'm calling to urge the board to not approve a budget until it includes a raise for classified pay and an essential areas redesign that does not sacrifice music and art. Our current program supports quality physical education district-wide and is consistent across campuses. All AIC students receive the same number of music, art, and PE minutes. This new redesign proposal will create inequities and gaps in instructional support across the district. With this essential areas plan, we are creating an unorganized district of schools instead of a unified district. 50 out of our 78 elementary campuses will be getting less music and art minutes. It's a plan that will cost $8 million and negatively impact AISD's core values of providing a safe and equitable whole child education. Let's reverse course on this district rollout and instead give our classified staff a pay raise so they can have a livable wage and explore other options for elementary planning like early release. At the very least, we should delay the district-wide rollout of this program and pilot this plan only at campuses that are ready to safely accommodate daily PE. Thank you for your urgent attention to quality physical education and AISD. Hello, my name is Courtney Perry. I'm a community member. I'm also a former AISD teacher and former proud member of Education Austin. I'm here to urge the board to not approve a budget until it includes a raise for classified pay and an essential areas redesign that doesn't sacrifice music and art. The first demand of our at what, at what cost campaign is essential as classified employees are the backbone of our district and they aren't being paid a livable wage. In addition, the current essential areas redesign is not ready for rollout, nor is it equitable. 50 out of our 78 elementary campuses will be getting less music and art minutes. It's a plan that will cost $8 million and negatively impacts ASD core values of providing a safe and equitable whole child education. Let's reverse course on this district rollout and instead give our classified staff a $6.50 pay raise, bringing the minimum pay up to $20 an hour, reinstate a substitute pay agreement at the elementary level, and explore other options for elementary planning, like early release. We appreciate your urgent attention and commitment to creating a budget that reflects our district's priorities. I really appreciate your time and your service. Thank you. 
Hi, this is Emily Kay, and I'm an art teacher with Austin ISD, and I want to encourage the board to vote against the essential area redesign line in the budget. Uh, this is an equity issue, not just a operational issue. The special ed department can still only do adaptive PE next year once every three days. So a lot of children who have special needs will be left out of PE if it is every day. Additionally, the district released that uh, the minutes of art and music vary widely between 4,320 to 6,480 minutes, depending on the campus a child goes to. Again, that's an equity issue. Additionally, on top of that, 50 out of 78 schools are getting less than our current 5,400 art and music minutes, which is equal across the board. And finally, safety. Most gyms aren't built for these large classes, and PE teachers will be utilizing sp outdoor spaces to rotate children through because there will be so many of them. With recent events in mind, there is no hiding for large groups outside all day, every day, and it will become pretty obvious pretty quickly that children are outside all day, every day. If anything happens, it's on the board. My name is Megan Deatherage. I'm a mother to two elementary school children um, at AISD, and my husband is also a middle school teacher working for AISD. I'm calling to express my concern about the plan to increase PE time for elementary students for next year and decrease their time with music and art. Music and art are hugely important to my children, and um, I don't think it's a good idea to reduce the amount of time they have with these specials, nor do I think it's a good idea to have them in these huge PE classes every day. Um, 45 students does not sound like even one teacher or you know one assistant could be able to watch that amount of students effectively. I think AASC should take this year to do a pilot program, plan out this idea a little bit better, especially since the superintendent is leaving and this is a huge change to make. Um, my other concern is teacher, um, compensation. So many teachers are leaving the district and administrators uh, for better paying districts. I think AASD needs to seriously look at taking this money that they were going to use for this program and putting it towards a raise for teachers. At least 5%. Claire Ruder, parent, teacher emeritus. I know an Education Austin member, highly qualified, who's been with the district for 10 plus years, paid as a paraprofessional and then as a professional. 60 years old, never been able to afford a home here. Used to have two minutes to talk at his meetings and now one. That teacher, she has a son. You forced her to take the most basic computer class as a high school freshman. In one of your computer systems, he was exploring vulnerabilities and there were many. You criminalized him, kicked him out, and even care when the co-founder of Apple spoke on the child's behalf. But four years later, the child graduated in the first class during pandemic 2020. And two years later, with no college, no thanks to you, he makes more money than his talented mom with a master's of education. Stop killing dreams and stealing time. Yes, elementary teachers need more planning time, but that time needs to belong to them, the professionals. Stop the micromanagement. Stop demands that lead to burnout, resignation, and even death. Early release for elementary. Three, two, one, beep. My time is up. Hi, my name is Suzanne Kearns. I'm a parent of two AISD students. I want to thank AISD for their hard work in creating such amazing, comprehensive, inclusive sex ed lessons for grades K through 12. I am here asking you to vote yes to implement these important lessons. The process of bringing comprehensive sex ed lessons to AISD students has been a long one. The good news is that means that there's been plenty of time to survey parents, even twice, and ensure that their voices are being heard. The most recent survey completed by over 2,900 respondents showed that depending on the grade and lessons, between 74 to 89% of parents want their kids to receive these important lessons. As a parent, I appreciate that you give weight to our feedback, but I also strongly believe that parents should let professionals who are trained in designing curriculum uh, complete their area of expertise and do their jobs. So please vote yes and don't make kids wait any longer to receive these important lessons. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Beth Thornton and I am a proud AISD assistant principal and parent of two AISD students. I called today to share my concerns with you as an AISD assistant principal, parent, and dedicated advocate for public education. This year alone, the increased demands of COVID, the PPFT walkthroughs, and the testing requirements have placed a tremendous burden and responsibility on the shoulders of administration. 
assistant principals are expected to balance all of those things in a fairly even partnership with their principals and should likewise be adequately compensated. While there is an almost 40% increase in salary between assistant principal and principal, there is hardly any change, less than 8% daily, between being a teacher and an assistant principal. Assistant principals do not get paid vacation or adjustments in their contract days when unpaid holidays are added to the calendar. AISD just added in two more unpaid holidays to the next school year. Assistant principals are now required to return to work July 13th, three and a half weeks before teachers. This shrinking summer break is a diminishing incentive for a career like this with such a high burnout rate. One of two things should have happened. Either contract days should be revised or these holidays should be paid. Emily Sawyer, parent, speaking on the student code of conduct. My experience has shown me that often, when we don't find fault with harmful and exclusionary discipline practices, it's because we assume that our own children will not be subject to those practices. Whether because of wishful thinking or good luck or privilege bestowed upon us by society, we assume these practices will be mated out on the quote-unquote bad kids who quote-unquote deserve it to protect the quote-unquote good kids. I implore each of us to remember that every kid who gets sent to a room by themselves all day or sent to ALC or expelled is someone's child. Causing more harm as a consequence for harm does not decrease harm. And I want to implore us to throw away this mindset. A sense of safety rooted in control and coercion is a false sense of safety. We can create a restorative, reparative, transformationally just education system where wrongs happen, but rarely, and they are dealt with in community, so everyone feels loved, safe, and belonging. We just have to want to, and we just have to believe that everyone deserves that. Thank you. Greetings, trustees and interim superintendent. My name is Stacy Smith, and I'm a library media specialist at Go Valley Elementary with two kids in schools in East Austin. Thank you for including a library media specialist in the proposed raise. We deserve it. Please include classified staff for a better raise, uh, more than $15 an hour. Our TAs and custodians definitely deserve it. Please go back to the initial proposal for elementary planning time, early release day for elementary only. I believe that will be less expensive than the proposed area redesign. It does limit art and music, which does limit art and music in several of our schools. Please know that teachers plan better when kids are out of the building. Teachers plan better when kids are out of the building and in this day of school safety where we have to have our eyes everywhere, I think this would be a better plan, an early release day for teachers to plan in peace. Um, thank you so much and please don't pass this budget with this essential areas redesign. Go for early release day. It'll be less expensive, better for teachers, better for kids. My name is Becca L.A.K., and I've taught elementary physical education in Austin ISD for 13 years. Hey, Board of Trustees, please wake up to the unorganized District of Schools mess that is scheduled to start next year with the essential areas redesign. Please pump the brakes on the scheduling nightmare that is currently showing 50 out of 78 elementary schools with less art and music next year than this past year. Please stop calling it an everyday PE plan. Physical education and physical activity are not the same thing. At best, we will have students receiving inequitable instruction across the district. At worst, we will have unsafe, overcrowded physical activity in classes and endanger or exclude the students who need adapted PE teachers that the district is not staffing for them. Adapted PE teachers are not being staffed for increased minutes, so this, those students will sit in the corner or miss out if their APE teacher is on a different campus. Pump the brakes on this line of the budget and start with early release or a pilot program to increase teacher planning instead of taking away music and art and endangering the safety of students and the quality of physical education in AISD. Staff daily PE with more PE teachers, not TAs. 70% of schools that had one PE teacher and two TAs have had their PE teacher. Hi, my name is Nikki Leatherwood. I'm a proud graduate, parent, and teacher in AISD. I'm calling to address item 9.1, the budget, specifically the essential area redesign. I urge the trustees not to vote on a budget that has the new essential area plan in the budget. I am very concerned that during a financial crisis, we are planning to spend $8 million to create an essential area plan where 50 out of 78 schools will be receiving less art and music instruction than they currently receive. This is a huge glaring equity issue that we are about to create within our district. I'm especially concerned about the safety issues daily grade 
grade level PE classes will create in our schools. The majority of our schools were built long ago with gyms that can only handle at most a class and a half of students. The rest of the groups will likely be outside. In addition to the realities of the weather in Texas not making this a viable plan for much of the school year, in the wake of Uvalde, how are these teachers supposed to keep 90 kids running around outdoors safe? Where will they run and hide when they have an open field as a classroom and a chain link fence as their walls? This plan is not safe. It is not in the best interest of students, and it is not in the best interest of AISD. Increasing planning time for elementary teachers is important. Please consider other options, such as early release days or moving dismissal back to 245, which will increase planning time by an hour and a half a week, cost considerably less money, and keep our children safe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chrissy Haney. I'm a teacher and parent in AISD and a member of Education Austin. I wish to address two facets of the budget. According to the MIT Living Wage Calculator, the living wage for a household in Austin with two working adults and two children is $21.76. Education Austin is demanding a wage increase for classified employees to $20 per hour. Classified employees are public servants and deserve to be paid accordingly. Secondly, the Elementary Essential Areas Redesign Plan must be scrapped immediately. The three-day music art PE rotation has been in place for 40 years, and it's been the envy of many surrounding districts. Depriving children of music and art education will be unsafe and inequitable and will only serve to widen the achievement gap. This district has countless elementary essential areas teachers who are highly trained, highly qualified professionals with great ideas. Look at the numbers and scrap the plan now, then use the upcoming school year to listen to your teachers and challenge the Texas legislature's mismanagement of recapture funding and implement a plan that will benefit every teacher and every child. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sydney Spann. I am an art teacher at Hart Elementary. I have been at the Hart for nine years, and I've loved teaching in Austin ISD because of the high value that is placed on the fine arts. I am calling to address item 9.1, the budget, specifically the essential area redesign. I am urging the trustees to please not vote on a budget that has the new essential area plan in this budget. Do not approve this item. I am so concerned that during a time when AISD is struggling with budget that we are proposing adding $8 million to our budget to fund a plan that should not be approved. It is not equitable for our students. My students at my school will receive less music and art time and unsafe PE classes that are too large to be able for a PE teacher to monitor them safely. This, our students need more art and music time, more fine arts, and this plan gives them less. It is not equitable because not all schools are receiving the same amount of art and music. It is not a good plan. My name is Bree Rolf, and I'm a proud member of Education Austin and a teacher at Bowie High School. I'm here to urge the board to not approve a budget until it includes a raise for classified staff and an essential areas redesign that doesn't sacrifice music and art. The first demand of our At What Cost campaign is essential as classified employees are the backbone of our district and they aren't being paid a livable wage. In addition, the current essential areas redesign is not ready for rollout or equitable. 50 of our 78 elementary campuses will be getting less music and art minutes. It's a plan that will cost $8 million and negatively impact AISD's core values of providing a safe and equitable whole child education. Let's reverse course on this district rollout and instead give our classified staff a 650 pay raise, bringing the minimum pay up to $20 an hour, reinstate a substitute pay agreement at the elementary level, and explore other options for elementary planning like early release. We appreciate your urgent attention and commitment to creating a budget that reflects our district's priorities. Good evening. My name is Candace Hunter and I'm a parent. I'm speaking to you on item 4.1, the interim superintendent. The ability to lead a group of people or even an entire department is not the same as leading an organization as vast and as diverse as the Austin Independent School District. I'm asking that each board member consider carefully the next appointment. Whomever is chosen must have a plan of action to move the district forward, even as the great resignation continues, staggering fiscal challenges persist, and community trust further erodes. While it might seem best to choose someone familiar, it may not serve to heal our district. 
Please look objectively at the candidates beyond any relationship they may have with you, district partners, or vendors. I'm asking as you make your selection that you seek an individual that the community can trust, someone willing to disrupt the systems that historically and currently marginalize underserved communities. We have a year before the installation of our next superintendent. We should not, we cannot waste this opportunity by staying the previous course set for us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rodney Bergwin. I'm an Austin citizen. I live here, work here, pay taxes, <clears throat> and know, you know, I know some kids in the school district. And I just wanted to speak uh, on my thoughts to how it could be improved. And I think two things that, you know, absolutely have to happen. I think that we need to be raising the minimum wage in the entire district, uh, at least up to $20 an hour to account for inflation. And I am willing to pay more taxes for that. And we need to be, um, you know, listening to these teachers and providing them with the things that they need, uh, you know, funding the classes that are necessary for these students' developments in an all-around sense, not just focusing on test scores and, um, you know, preparing them to be workers. We need to prepare them for them to think on their own and collaborate and practice critical thinking. And so to do that, we need to empower the teachers as much as possible. And so that's all I have to say about it. Again, my name is Rodney Bergwin, and I hope you take my words into serious consideration. Thank you. My name is Courtney Rock, and I am an art teacher at Mills Elementary. I am a proud graduate, parent, and teacher in AISD, and I'm calling to address the item 9.1, the budget, specifically the essential area redesign. I urge the trustees not to vote for a budget that funds the new essential areas redesign. It is not equitable. I have taught art at eight elementary schools in AISD, and there's already so much inequity between schools. This redesign would even further the equity gap between schools by taking precious minutes away from students that desperately need art and music instruction. We already know there's a strong correlation between the fine arts and academic achievement. We are spending $8 million so that 50 out of 78 schools will be receiving less art and music instruction than they currently receive. How does that make sense? As a parent, I'm concerned about the safety of 80 or 90 students together in a PE class. This plan does not account for so many SPED students that need extra support. That is not safe. Please consider other options for increased planning time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brooke Anderson. I'm a parent of two daughters in AISD, one in sixth grade and one in ninth grade. And I am in full support of a comprehensive sex education program. Our children need to learn facts. They need to have a broad understanding of their own bodies. And I think it is super important that this is provided at school. Um, we know that school is a safe place for students. They trust their teachers. They feel supported there. And they need to learn um, very factual and comprehensive information um, during the school day for something as important as their own bodies and sexual education. Um, I also want to say thank you so much for your time to all the board members. I know that um, you give up so much of yourselves and your personal lives to support our school district. So thank you so much and thank you for supporting comprehensive sex ed. Hi, my name is Drew Lukey. I'm a proud graduate and teacher in AISD. I'm calling to address item 9.1, the budget, specifically the essential area redesign. I urge the trustees not to vote on a budget that has the new essential area plan in the budget. I'm very concerned that during the financial crisis, we are planning to spend $8 million to create an essential area plan where 50 out of 78 schools will be receiving less art and music instruction than they currently receive. This is a huge equity issue we are about to create within our district. And I am very concerned about the safety issues, daily grade level, large PE classes that will be created in our schools. Um, we are not equipped to deal with all of this, especially in the wake of Udvaldi and the Texas heat. 
Um, but I will say increasing planning time for elementary teachers is important. Please consider other options such as early release days or moving dismissal back to 245. Thank you and please consider our My name is Becky Shaheen and I am a former employee, parent of two and live in District 6. I sent my full comments via email to the board, but with limited time and a rising third grader that would like some of it, I needed to keep this short and sweet. First, our next superintendent needs a written plan to restore staff morale and retention. We also need to revert DC local policy back to what it was prior to the summer of 2020. Our special ed department needs to be prioritized. They are in such dire need of resources and support. Regarding budget, we need raises and a full stop on essential area redesign. And here is the sweet part, my rising third grader. My name is Emily and I go to Becker. I want more art and music, not less. It makes me feel sad because my art teacher, Ms. Sanabria, has been so awesome and I love art. <laughs> the same thing with Ms. Champion. She was my music teacher. Music is a big part of my life. Thank you for your time. My name is Emily Derringer. I'm the parent of a 10th grader and a 6th grader in AISD schools. Um, I'm calling to voice my support for the proposed human sexuality and responsibility lessons um, that were approved unanimously um, by the School Health Advisory Council earlier this week. Um, I, I urge you to please um, vote in favor of that curriculum um, so that we can provide um, comprehensive, inclusive sex ed in Austin ISD. Thank you. Hi, this is Deborah Trejo, and I'm calling about agenda item number 9.1 about the recommended budget. And I'm asking that you not approve a budget that includes the redesign of PE and special areas in elementary school to delete, remove core instructional time from a school district in which less than half of third graders are reading on grade level. Um, the proposed plan uh, should at best be piloted in a few elementary schools, but it should not, there should not be a unilateral action um, to reduce instructional time and throw 44 kids in the same room for PE. Um, it is not the way to get more planning time for elementary teachers. It will disproportionately impact students with disabilities um, as they, they're not additional staffing for adaptive PE, will force us to compete for TAs, um, and will not be a good setting for them to have and their instructional needs met. Um, please oppose any budget that includes this $8 million expenditure, uh, with, which is not likely to be equitable or lead to positive results. Thank you so much, bye. Hello, my name is Suzanne, and I'm the parent of three AISD students, two who attend Sunset Valley and one who attends Kiker. And I'm also a member of the Coalition for Special Education Equity, CSEE. -E. I'm speaking on agenda item 9.1, and I'm urging the board not to approve the budget with the proposed plan to redesign the essentials areas. The proposed plan will cost the district $8 million at the expense of academic instructional minutes and music and art programs. The teacher to student ratio of one to 44 will adversely affect some of our students with special needs, including mine. In addition, there are currently 183 vacancies for teaching assistants, which include many critical areas for special education, like scores, SBS, and life skills, and students with intensive needs for support staff like mine. <laughs> the creation of teaching assistant positions for PE will compete with the critical need to fill large and already existing special education vacancies. This plan is not equitable. It's not safe. It robs our kids of music, art, and wow time. Please find another way to meet the need for additional planning time for our teachers. Hi, my name is Sarah G, and I'm a concerned community member who lives across the street from an AISD school. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, tightened restrictions on time for all of our teachers. I believe that we need the elementary school teachers to have the time they deserve to work closely with students and do planning, and that includes librarians and counselors. Um, and we just need to keep up our schools being high quality and you know, make sure our students don't have any mental health crises. Um, and the best way to do this, obviously, would be to also pay these teachers a living wage by bringing up the minimum pay. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Wendy Escobedo, and I'm a graduation coach. I'm a proud member of Education Austin, and I want to speak about agenda item 9.1, the budget. We ask the board to not approve any budget that does not meet demand number one in our at what cost campaign, which is a $6.50 pay raise for all classified employees, bringing the minimum pay up to $20 an hour. Classified staff are the people who transport our children to and from school. They are the people who feed the children healthy meals every day. They are the first point of contact for everyone who walks into a building in the district. They provide highly skilled, complex care to some of the highest need students in the district. They ensure a clean and safe learning environment for all our learners. It's well past time for AISD to properly compensate classified employees, especially as the cost of living in Austin continues to rise. My name is Helen Miller, President Rodriguez, School Board Trustee, Superintendent Ellis Bay. As of this day, ALC has not been restructured with much needed resources, and it has been a whole year. Special ed students that are sent to JJAP by the course don't have the resources to accommodate the students, so they send them over to ALC, which is a safety issue. Why are there no special ed resources at JJAEP? Where's the professional rehab drug council for the alternative to learning center? Why is there not some type of fine arts program at ALC? Why does human capital use the same formula when determining staffing issues at ALC? ALC is not a comprehensive campus. When did the CFO and human capital get involved in campuses' budgets? Why has human capital created so many new positions in their department? How does the human capital department get to create so many new positions? Why are there so many assistant superintendent positions in AISD now? I still would like to know what type of resources and adventures are built. My name is Nancy Lopez. I am a parent of a student who is at KC Elementary. I'm also a member of the Collision for Special Education Equity. I'm speaking on agenda item 9.1. I am urging the board not to approve the budget with the proposed plan to redesign the central areas. The proposed plan will cost the district $8 million at the expense of academic instructional minutes and music and art programs. The, the teacher to student ratio of one to 44 will adversely affect some of our students with special needs. In addition, there are currently 183 vacancies for teaching assistants, which include many critical areas for special education like sports, SBS, and life skills, and students with intensive needs for support staff. The creation of teaching assistant positions for PE will, com will compete with the critical needs to fill large already existing special education vacancies. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Heather Merritt, and I am an Austin ISD parent in District 6 and an AISD special education teacher since 2004. I'm also a proud Education Austin member as well as a CC member for the Coalition of Special Education Equity. I'm speaking on agenda item 9.1, and I'm urging the board not to approve the budget with a proposed plan to redesign essential areas. The proposed plan will cost the district $8 million at the expense of academic instructional minutes and music and art programs. In addition, the teacher to student ratio of one to 44 will adversely affect some of our students with special needs, like students with sensory, attention, and behavioral needs. In addition, there currently are 183 vacancies for teaching assistants in Austin ISD, which include many critical areas for special education like scores, SBS, and life skills, and students with intensive needs for support staff. The creation of teaching assistant positions for PE will compete with the critical need to fill large, already existing special education vacancies. I fully support an increase for classified staff to $20 an hour, and I ask the board to pilot the implementation of the redesign program to a limited number of campuses while Austin ISD can considers other options for elementary planning. Please do not. My name is Annalisa Reyes and I'm a parent of three students at Case Elementary and a member of the Coalition for Special Education Equity. I'm speaking on agenda item 9.1 and I'm urging the board not to approve the budget with the proposed plan to redesign essential areas. The proposed plan will cost the district $8 million at the expense of academic instructional minutes and music and art programs. The teacher to student ratio of one to 44 will adversely affect some of our students with special needs. 
for example, students with autism, like my son. In addition, there are currently 183 vacancies for teaching assistants, which include many critical areas for special education, like scores, SDS, life skills, and students with intensive needs for support staff. The creation of teaching assistant positions for PE will compete with the critical need to fill large, already existing special education vacancies. I firmly believe that the board can come up with a better plan to support the school and all students across the board while also giving time for planning for teachers. There is a better plan and there's a way to do it with less money. You guys can do that. Thank you and have a good day. This is Sharon Vane, the parent of an AISD high schooler and an AISD graduate. I'm going to echo here the numerous calls to revisit budget proposals that don't give classified staff a raise and rob many elementary schools of dedicated art and music time as part of the essential areas redesign. While the time for budget decisions is nigh, you as a board also have a budget proposal created under district leadership that no longer will be at the helm come fall. Now is the time to carefully consider whether what's currently proposed is actually what's ideal for our district and what can be changed to better align with what will best support students, educators, staff, and families. Let's have our budget truly reflect our values and our priorities. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Ramirez, and I'm a physical therapist with the Special, ed, um, special Education Department in the district, um, and I'm also a proud member of Education Austin. I'm here to urge the board to not approve a budget until it includes a raise for classified pay and essential areas redesign that doesn't sacrifice music and art. The first demand of our at what cost campaign is essential as classified employees are the backbone of our district and they aren't being paid a livable wage. In addition, the current essential areas redesign is not ready for rollout or equitable. 50 out of our 78 elementary campuses will be getting less music and art minutes and it's a plan that's gonna cost $8 million and negatively impact AIC's core values of providing a safe and equitable whole child education. We should reverse course on this district rollout and instead give our classified staff a $6.50 $6 pay raise, bringing the minimum pay up to $20 an hour, reinstate a substitute pay agreement at the elementary level, and explore other options for elementary planning like early release. We appreciate your urgent attention and commitment to creating a budget that reflects our district's priorities. Good evening, Dr. Elizalde and Board of Trustees. My name is Paula Bowen and I am the TA Brown PE teacher and APER member. I'm calling regarding the proposed changes to the essential areas redesign for next school year. Our robust PE curriculum is second to none. Our AISD gyms were made to safely accommodate single class sizes utilizing equipment that is necessary to fulfilling the curriculum requirements and meeting the state peaks. With entire grade levels attending PE at one time, many campuses do not have space. Even campuses that appear prepared for this redesign, what happens to the safety and teaching spaces when reality hits and there's no substitute for the other PE teachers or aides or inclement weather becomes an issue? Do 75 to 150 students move into the gym? Our district has had five adaptive PE teachers who serve as six to eight campuses each in our current three-day rotation. How will they provide these sped services daily? How many kids will be neglected or injured in this grade level PE fiasco? How will we keep an entire grade level safe during an emergency? Consider delaying the district-wide rollout of this program and pilot this plan only at campuses that are ready to safely accommodate daily PE. If a pilot plan is considered, each school participating should be required to provide proof of space to safely accommodate all all students before they can be. Hi, this is Chris Qualick, and I am calling regarding the proposed changes to special areas. And I am specifically concerned about the requirement for daily PE, as I don't think that this can be carried out safely due to some of the older elementary schools just not having the space and sending children outside in Texas is just not always feasible. Additionally, I think that daily PE would impair the ability of the PE teacher to provide the quality of instruction that my children have received thus far in their education with AISD. Additionally, I'm concerned about the impact on music and art, which are so important for the developing brain and for some kids are their only opportunity for these lessons. And lastly, I, I'm concerned that with this 
pressure on the special areas teachers, we're going to continue to lose more great teachers. And we should be able to find another way to get the planning time that our teachers so desperately need. And that's it. Hi, my name is Jake Morgan. I'm a proud member of Education Austin and a teacher on one of many campuses that stands on the efforts of our classified employees. I'm calling in to urge the board not to pass a budget unless it includes a living wage for these workers and an essential areas redesign that doesn't sacrifice our students' needs for music and art classes. The decision you make today will have ripples through the upcoming school year and beyond, and with the departure of the superintendent, the impacts of this decision will fall on your shoulders alone. Please do the right thing for our students, our staff, and our community. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Austin ISD Board of Trustees. My name is Mary Castle, and I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Texas Values. I'm here to testify against item 7-2. Sex education should not be taught to kids as young as kindergarten. I adhere the board to delete all the plans to teach sex education from kindergarten through second grade. I'm also in opposition of gender neutral language that is promoting gender identity and gender confusion to young students. I would recommend the board delete all sex ed courses that are lower than fourth grade, as even at the State Board of Education, it was approved in the health teaks that human sexuality only be taught at grades fourth grade or higher. You should teach accurate biology and not an agenda, and any curriculum in higher grades should also be met with caution as well. Please proceed with caution and do not adopt the materials recommended by the SHAC for kindergarten through third grade on human sexuality. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Star Taylor. I am a parent of two students in AISD. I'm calling to ask you to reconsider the essential area redesign at the elementary level. Um, my problem with it is the inequities that it provides throughout the district. Um, right now, uh, my student, my daughters currently get 5,400 minutes in art and music. And with this change, it would give them less time in art and music. The other problem that I have with it is also that it is going to be uh, inequitable across the district as some schools will have a different schedule uh, than another. I don't feel like this is uh, makes for good quality education across the board. I also understand that uh, gym safety is not going to be provided. There's not enough space in a current AISD school for the amount of students that are going to be in the gym at once. And I do not feel comfortable with this redesign. I know the ABC schedule has worked for uh, many, several decades, and I don't see why this is a good reason to change it now, especially with. Hi, my name is Nicole Fagerberg. I'm a parent with two kids within AISD school system. I'm also an attorney. I'm calling first about the superintendent search. I'd like that to be as transparent as possible. Um, I've read that AISD spent $150,000 litigating to prevent responding to a public information act on one of the previous superintendent searches, and I think that's totally unacceptable. I understand that you know names and resumes need to be redacted, but AIS, AISD's formulations of questions, evaluations, all those other things of, of what AISD is looking for needs to be open and transparent. Um, the second thing I would say is that um, I really feel like the magnet schools are struggling right now, and I would like to have the previous funding restored to the magnets that was recently reduced. I believe April is either 2020 or 2021, and I'd like to have a review taken of how the magnet schools are doing with that reduced funding. Lastly, um, Keeling has recently lost its principal. I'd like to put in a request that any principal appointed to Keeling have experience as a principal in the past and also experience with both uh, gifted and talented programming or experience with magnet schools. Thank you. So Hello, my name is Whitney Shumate. I'm a teacher at Bowie High School and I'm a member of Education Austin. I'm here to urge the board to not approve a budget until it includes a raise for classified staff and an essential areas redesign that doesn't sacrifice music and art. I have a daughter who attends Cowan Elementary, and I know the value of all of our special and essential areas. Um, in addition, I think that there needs to be some additional um, discussion and a review of board policy um, DC local and DC regulation when it comes to employment practices, as they ought to reflect the values of our community, um, including second chances, 
as well as restoring some power to the school board when it comes to hiring. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Julianne Spellman. I'm the PE teacher at Baldwin Elementary and an APER member. I'm calling regarding the proposed changes to the elementary essential areas. By now, you have heard that there are many issues with this plan. Our gyms were made to accommodate single class sizes with entire grade levels attending PE concurrently. Many campuses do not have space for multiple PE classes. Our current plan supports quality physical education where all students receive the same number of music, art, and PE minutes. In this current proposal, Campus Choice will create inequities and gaps in instructional support. With this plan, we are creating an unorganized district of schools instead of a unified district. I want to voice my support for proposed solution in which to delay the district-wide rollout of this program and look for alternative options that honor our district values of equity, inclusivity, and a whole child approach. Thank you for your urgent attention to quality physical education. Hi, my name is Frank Netcher, and I'm an expecting parent and a proud supporter of Education Austin. I'm here to urge the board to not approve a budget until it includes a raise for classified pay and an essential areas redesign that won't sacrifice music and art. The first demand at, of our At What Cost campaign is essential as classified employees are the backbone of our district, and they aren't being paid a livable wage. In addition, the current essential areas redesign is not ready for rollout or equitable. 50 out of our 78 elementary school campuses will be getting less music and art minutes in the live music capital of the world. It's a plan that will cost $8 million and negatively impact AISD's core values of providing a safe and equitable whole child education. Let's reverse course on this district rollout and instead give our classified staff a 650 uh, pay raise, bringing the minimum pay up to $20 an hour and reinstate a substitute pay agreement at the elementary level and explore other options for elementary planning like early release. We appreciate your urgent attention and commitment to creating a budget that reflects our district's top priorities. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa Flores. I'm a parent and member of the Coalition for Special Education Equity in AISD. I'm calling about agenda item 9.1 and ask the trustees to reject the essential areas redesign. It is not ethical representation to codify in a budget less access to planning for elementary special education teachers while ensuring it for others. It is also unethical to ensure less access to adapted PE while ensuring daily PE for for everyone else. The plan means two hours weekly less of less instructional time for all, which will disproportionately affect students with disabilities, with which our data already shows gaps. Simply put, it is unethical for trustees to vote for egregious inequities for special education students and staff in order to allow others to benefit. The over $7 million cut to special education will exasperate an already broken system, and the $8 million price tag to enact the plan would be better invested in special education to avoid maintenance of effort issues. Allow the minority schools who want this plan to be implemented to do so as a pilot program and instead allow the majority of schools to focus on implementing wild time with fidelity. Thank you very much. I hope that you can vote your conscience and not uh, vote for savings on the backs of students with disabilities and the staff that serve them. It's simply unfair. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Vanessa McDougall. I am the parent of an Anderson High student and I am calling to ask that the board um, approve comprehensive and comprehensive uh, sex ed curriculum that includes STI and pregnancy prevention. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Ariel Kay and I'm a proud graduate and teacher in AISD. I am calling to address item 9.1. I urge you trustees not to vote on a budget that has the new essential area plan in it. I have taught elementary art in AISD for seven years and I am concerned that during a financial crisis, we would spend $8 million to create an essential area plan where most elementary schools will be receiving less art and music instruction. This is an equity issue we cannot create within our district. I am concerned about the safety issues daily grade level large PE classes will create and if AISD cares about <clears throat> social emotional learning and cultural proficiency and inclusiveness practices a combined grade level class of 60 or more students does not provide the opportunity for the PE teacher to implement these practices increasing planning time for elementary teachers is important please consider other options 
As an elementary school teacher that is taught with a three-day rotation for seven years, when I have classes on Wednesdays, I only see students once a week. I don't like Wednesdays because I only get to connect with students once. And if a student is absent that day, they receive no art instruction for the entire week. I urge you to keep our current three-day rotation and please do not make every day a Wednesday. Hello, my name is Pamela McFadden. I've been an AIA teacher for seven years. Uh, I've been teaching pre-K four, and I worked at two Title One schools. I understand the need that the district has to make money, but I'm very disappointed to find that AIC is making is taking pre-K teacher positions away from Title One schools and allotting them for schools who have students that would qualify through tuition. My school is losing teacher positions for pre-K, while on the west side, our schools are gaining tuition with lower enrollment. The district, the district speaks of equity, and now I understand it's just a buzzword. They're taking teachers from schools who have low socioeconomic status from the east side and giving them to schools who have parents that can pay for their education on the west side. I am beyond upset that these children are being used to earn the district more money. My students deserve a teacher who can give them an individual relationship. This will not happen with more than 25 four-year-olds in one classroom. Thank you. Hi, I'm the mother of an AISD elementary school student, and I was just calling to voice my concern over the essential areas redesign. Please do not let this design happen. Please do not approve the budget. No one I've talked to thinks that this is a beneficial redesign for the students, for faculty, for staff. It's just a bad idea all around. And please, board, listen to your constituents and not approve this. Thank you. Bye. Hi, my name is Lily Heim. I'm calling in regards to the agenda item 7.2, K through 12, human sexuality and responsibility curriculum. I just wanted to call to support this um, new curriculum as um, a former uh, AISD student um, who grew up in Austin and went to AISD K through 12, someone whose little brother is uh, there now and someone who uh, is a t used to be a uh, teach and work with um, uh, elementary and middle school students um, in creative writing camps and uh, throughout youth. Um, I think the curriculum is amazing in, in that it's really open and honest about op opening conversations that our students are already curious about. These kids are already wanting to know more about uh, healthy relationships and how to communicate and their bodies. And um, I think it's really important that we give them the tools to um, to do so. So I wanted to just support this measure, um, this new curriculum, and thank you very much. Hi, my name is Matt Jaffe. I'm the parent of a soon-to-be first grader at Clayton. I'm calling because I'm concerned about uh, what I've been hearing about the essential area redesign and the resulting safety issues, particularly around PE. Uh, having, you know, one or two PE instructors responsible for 40 or 60 kids, you know, depending on the school and what you hear, there's, I think there's also some inequity issues at hand with, you know, different uh, um, numbers of teachers and aides at different schools. Uh, but in any case, uh, that, that seems inadequate to provide, you know, good supervision and, and safety for our kids. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, that, that is my concern. Hi, my name is Michelle Ramirez, and I'm a social worker in the Austin, Texas community, working with young people uh, for over 10 years. I wanted to call in favor for the uh, uh, improvements done to the human sexuality and responsibility uh, curriculum that was newly revised. I strongly believe that these revisions will support students in understanding their bodies, um, increase the representation of uh, you know diversity of lived experience and also increase the sense of belonging that students feel in the district. Additionally, I, I believe that it will help reduce sexual violence and help students find language to ask for help when they need it. So again, voting in favor for the improvements to the human sexuality um, and responsibility curriculum. 
Good evening. This is Ken Zarapis, president of Education Austin. We are asking that the district and the board put a pause on the art, music, and PE proposal. We have received overwhelming calls over the last weeks and months from teachers, TAs, and even principals that this plan will create confusion and inequity if implemented. After arguably the most difficult year in the 25 that I've been around AISD, we believe that an implementation and a change of this magnitude as we transition from one administration to a new one next spring is asking too much. We would like to see the pilot program of six schools, run the program, see how well it works, and then allow other campuses to divide a plan that will fit their needs. And we may discover opportunities for an even more creative and inventive way of addressing the problem that we're solving for, and that is planning time for teachers that is essential, but we need to get more buy-in. We would ask that the money that's set aside uh, for this plan, the $68 million, is then diverted to the hourly employees that need it so desperately in this district. As the city is raising its minimum wage potentially up to $22 an hour, it's important that AISD keeps pace and is at tw Thank you. Uh, this concludes public comment. Trustees, are there any questions or clarifications? Uh, Trustee Wagner? Um, well, first, I just want to say, just as a point of personal privilege, that I really appreciate all of the calls um, coming from our own community um, regarding the human sexuality curriculum. I know we've been getting a lot of letters, and um, they're coming from folks that don't live in Austin and oftentimes don't live in Texas, and so I really appreciate the feedback coming from our own community on that. Um, I did have a few clarifying questions on the many calls that we had about essentials. Uh, Dr. Lazaldi, I was wondering if I could ask you to just um, clarify a couple of things that were said to make sure I'm understanding correctly. I'll do my best to, to stick to, I know we've, I've talked with legal counsel about how far since the atom isn't posted for discussion. So I'll, I'll do my best to answer as many of the clarifying questions as I can. I appreciate that. Um, so I think one of the questions I had was um, Ms. Langen, who, special shout out to her as the president from ATPE for being here. Uh, appreciate her lending her voice to the conversation. And um, also she made mention, I think, to us both here as well as in a letter earlier that there was a concern about campuses having um, an equal standard or an equal distribution of, um, of learning time in our essentials, but because the campuses were campus by campus, that that may not be the case. So um, we provided parameters. The original design was to have um, one plan throughout all of our campuses that would be identical. The feedback we received throughout our process was that campuses wanted more autonomy. So I reverted back to then providing parameters around the expectations and then allowing the campus teams to create their own. And as long as they met the minimum requirements, they could have a variety. So when we hear things like they're gonna be different, well, that was by design and that was based on the feedback, we certainly could entertain the notion of creating one plan and making everybody do it the same way. I do want to clarify maybe a question that may be coming up. This is really not optional in terms of what our law requires. I, I now know there is not, we do not have plausible deniability when I've uncovered that um, TAC code 103.1003 requires us to have a minimum of 135 minutes of physical education per week, grades K through five, which essentially totals up to, um, I'll give you the exact amount, 4,860 minutes per school year. We are currently in violation of that. We only provide 2,700 minutes of PE per year. So, um, while I recognize this has been done, now that we know, and frankly, now that you know, we have an obligation to ensure that we're 
following that. And it's not just the intent of following the law, but in fact, the spirit of the law. Um, there's a, we, we have in our backyard, Dr. John Bartholomew at UT Austin, whose area of expertise is the relationship between increased physical education, social emotional learning, mental health, and in fact, academic outcomes. Um, he's got many studies that demonstrate an investment of physical education actually provides increases in academics. So while this started out, the goal was to provide teachers additional planning time. The discovery of reviewing the schedules is how we arrived at we were not providing those minutes. Um, so then the counter argument that I heard was, well, if we just make the teachers do wow. Well, I, I, I want to say that I think that's unconscionable. I'm asking elementary teachers who are most accountable for our reading scores at elementary level, which is foundational, that are teaching reading, writing, math, science, social studies, health. And I also want them to teach additional PE minutes to make up for the PE time. I don't see the equity in that. And so uh, could we do early releases? I mean, I'll try to address as many of the issues that I think I heard. Um, actually, doing an early release doesn't allow us to provide the additional 45 minutes required by law because you don't have enough time in the day to ensure that every teacher in their rotation gets a 45-minute duty-free um, planning period because that was one of the options that we had originally looked at. Um, so I think at a minimum, there's one other option. We could add six minutes to each school day, not the teacher day, just the student day, and that would provide the additional minutes that we reduced in music and art. So even though we were doubling, essentially almost doubling the amount of PE that is necessary in the new plan, we were not cutting art and music by half. In fact, we were cutting it only by about 18%. Um, and then some schools increased that, again, based on their, their own design. So we're happy to engage individually with individual schools, with principals, with communities, and, and with each trustee so that we can see what specifically the issues are, space, all of those. Um, Mr. Hicks has assured me he continues to go to the schools that have any concerns. We don't have any plans that I believe were turned in that had 100 kids in a gym uh, at one given time. Um, so what we will do is we'll provide an update to the specific individual campuses that Mr. Hicks has, as the associate soup over elementary um, specifically working with. And then I would encourage our teachers to visit with their campus principals and become part of that team that created that plan so that we can address it. And again, at the very least, we could take the 28 schools that created the plan that has as many or more minutes in the art and music, and we could use those and we could tell the other schools to select from one of those plans. So I think there are lots of options. I don't think we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And we would want to address, continue addressing the concerns. And I also want our elementary teachers to have time to do some planning um, in a way that allows them to be. We all know that time in and of itself doesn't mean that more is going to happen. It's the quality of the time, which is why we invested in allowing secondary teachers to have that planning. And this is not going to give them exactly the same amount of planning time. It's only two additional 45 minutes. But I think, again, the intent is to really make sure that our teachers um, do have some time during the day and that not everything is ha having, having them be done, having to have them do it after school for so much time. Thank you for that additional clarification. Um, I did, you mentioned the 28 schools versus the 50 that I think was called out by, in several public comments. Do you have a sense of those 50, what type of loss in time we're talking about? Um, is well, it like like kids would have hours less? No, or all, all, less? Of the, all of the campuses met the minimum requirement of, um, give me one second, 4,000, 320 minutes per year. So um, all of all of them met that that minimum threshold. And again, we have no concern with going back. And if you if, if after we meet as a team, um, as this is you know part of the the leadership decision making component, 
we can we can get together and we can visit and see if having other schools look at the 28 that had the same or more, including having more PE time. Perhaps the other campuses haven't seen those schedules mm -hmm. and after looking at them, maybe they would be interested in doing so. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity for us to work on ensuring that we get it right. Mm -hmm. And I don't wanna forget that this is about a requirement of ensuring that our students are meeting the expectation that I now know we were not in compliance with. So that would still have nece necessitated an increase in the budget. And in fact, the reason I heard some comments about TAs, um, that was my response to the feedback we got, that they wanted more support in the classroom, even though it's a 45 to one expectation by the Texas Education Agency, the team of teachers from APER recommended a 30 to one ratio and asked for a TA. And so I said, yes. And that's where some of the additional dollars are coming from is to provide those as they were requesting them. Okay, thank you can, for that. And I can I just, just a real yep. quick, if we could just, this is like uh, not a posted agenda topic. So I really would like to try to keep this to understand that the practice is to, to ask clarifying questions around public comment issues. If we could just limit it to just get clarification and just try to keep it. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bidio. Yes, thank keeping you. Keeping us on the straight and narrow. Okay. <laughs> Not looking to violate the Texas Open Meetings Act tonight. <laughs> so um, I appreciate all of the clarification there. I think just the outstanding issues that may be helpful in a board update may be, because um, I know we had talked initially that there wouldn't be a reduction in time for art and music under the intent of the plan to see if there may be opportunities to see how we could explore that so that teachers like Ms. Kay aren't in a position, um, per her comments earlier, to miss seeing kids a whole week or for several days in a row, and we'd still have those opportunities to share that type of instruction with the students since it is, our, special, our essentials are valuable. Um, those specials are, and I don't want us to get to a place where we're disregarding them, but I do appreciate that we keep coming back in an equity issue to discussing the fact that making sure our kids' core instruction, reading, math, those pieces continue to be priority for our students and making sure that that we're doing right by them in those areas as well. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Wagner. Um, Trustee Anderson and then Trustee Singh. A um, couple of clarifying questions. The first one is, um, what is the impact of not passing a budget? Well, we're in violation of the law, and therefore I don't know that TEA would release any funds, and I don't know that we'd be able to make payroll. Um, we could not make any expenditures. No, we couldn't make any expenditures without an approved budget. Thank you. Um, next question, a caller mentioned um, APs and unpaid holidays. All professional staff who are on our administrative pay grades, no professional staff are, are paid for holidays. Um, so we have different employees like principals that work 226 days. We have APs like elementary that work 207, middle school APs that work 218. None of those positions are paid for holidays. So we take their number of days times their daily rate and that's their annual compensation. That is divided by 12. We pay out over 12 months out of the course of the year equal payments, but no professional position gets paid holidays. But for clarification, but they get the same school holidays that Correct. everybody else is getting. Yeah, so we take the school calendar. So once you adopt a school calendar, then we take that calendar and we start counting, you know, day by day to say, okay, 207 day calendars, here's their start date and their end date. But we don't count like the week of um, Thanksgiving break. Like those five don't count as five work days. 
So it's it's going through the calendar and and counting days that would be work days, but we do not count those holidays as days. So in summary, they have a daily rate. They make X per day, and then however many days is in their contract, that's how many days they work, and that's what their salary is. And that's been true and is true across the board. So I, I think I heard it mentioned, and I, I could be wrong, is there an expectation for an AP to return to work, say, two or three days early and not be paid? No. So whatever your start date is, so let's say we have this year's calendar, we start counting and we get to 205, but they're on a 207-day contract. So then it's like, okay, do we start one day early, get out one day late? Do we start two days early? And we look at those things. So when we have a t an employee on a 207-day contract, we're paying t for 207 work days. Yes. So it may seem like I'm starting earlier in a given school year, but I'm going to work the same number of days. Yeah. I may end earlier, or there were more days in between that I didn't work. No yeah. one can be asked to work additional days without us paying them um, for those days. But I think there's some confusion just around Last year I might have started, and I'll just make up a date, maybe I started August 15th because our school day, you know, year was going to start a week later with students, and maybe I, my calendar has me coming a week before. And then the way the school calendar may fall, this year I may have to come in August 13th. But I'm still not going to work those two days and go longer into the year there are either fewer days that I'm working throughout that period of time or I'm going to end early. The number of days is going to be exactly the same regardless of when my start date is. Yeah. And it does, and sometimes it'll de depend on like when a holiday will fall, when weekends fall. So all of, if it's leap year, not leap year, if we give more days off during the school year, that all plays a role in where we start counting days and how we get to that total. Okay. Uh -huh. But we'll reach out to this particular employee so we can make sense of what I think, I th I, it makes sense to me what I think they think happened. And so we'll reach out to try to clarify. Okay. And then last one, um, a caller mentioned taking a pre-K teachers from um, east side schools and giving it to schools in areas that can pay tuition. So um, in the February of every year, we get the projections, and it's whatever the projected enrollment is, and they break it out by grade level, and we apply that formula. Now, I'm not going to say, it's to my knowledge, like when they give us that project and projection, that's based on the previous history, that kind of thing. So if I have a school that last year had 35 pre-K kids, that would be two teachers, and next year they're projected to have 20, then I, I need to find a place for that pre-K student. If I have another school who last year had 20 students, but next year they're projected 35, then I need to add a student over here. But we base it all on the projections that count, come out of um, the enrollment office. So what if uh, your projections say, you know, it's gonna be 20, and 30 or 40 show up, then what? Then that's what we call leveling. <laughs> so starting the first day of school, that's where we take in those numbers. And so let's say, and I've had it happen before, um, a school was projected <coughs> to have two kindergarten classrooms and they end up with another 20 students over that. We immediately send somebody out there, like either a substitute or we have a teacher that we know we don't need at a campus to set up that kindergarten classroom. So that's where we do that movement of people based on the actual bodies that show up. Because every year we're making a guess on on actual students. And last com um, comment, can you please follow up with Ms. Miller related to staffing for ALC and the concerns she had? Thank yes, ma'am.
Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll say I have one note of appreciation and a note of disappointment. Um, so my appreciation is for technology because we can do live fact checking, fact checking. So a couple of things, um, and then I'll get to my questions for clarification. So TEC, so that's Texas Education Code 28.002. I think that's a L. The way that it describes, and this is straight from TEA, um, from their website, the way that they describe the uh, physical activity requirement actually allows districts to do what we called wow time. So we were not in violation of that. Um, um, then point of clarification, there was observation that wow time was not being done at our schools. So that's a difference between fidelity of implementation versus the intent. The, the, what uh, should have been sure, happening is, I would, wow. I would agree, but to state that we were in compliance, I, I want to be clear, we were not. So my, my com so thank you for your comment. Um, my comment was districts are allowed to do what we called wow. That was my comment. Um, the other thing for clarification, so not for tonight because it's not a posted item, um, some of my concerns with uh, whether it's physical education or physical activity is one, hiring. And I saw the questions uh, that were responded to and posted on board docs. So I think there is some information there about the number of uh, positions and then the remaining vacancies. And I wanna say it was like 20 over 120. Um, so the clarification piece would be as we're headed toward this, you know, we're gonna implement the essentials redesign. Um, I think it's absolutely critical for the public to be aware of how the hiring process is going, not just for PE teachers, um, PETAs. We already know that PETAs get uh, paid uh, a lower amount than academic TAs. So there will be some ripple effects. Um, the other point for clarification for a later date before we vote on this on uh, June 23rd is the adaptive uh, special education physical uh, ed, so adaptive PE for um, students receiving special education. I heard from one family that their child, um, an elementary age child, um, has a medical condition and that child has to be in a wheelchair. And so currently, or at least last school year and prior, um, they, because of the size of the class and, and other issues, um, that child could get assistance during PE. And so I think that's one of the issues, again, just like clarity of communication out to the public, like what would that adaptive PE look like? Um, I think uh, there was a mention of, you know, there's been no observations of any uh, campus that plans to have 100 students in a PE gym. And I think that that's absolutely correct um, because what we see is that there's a plan to have um, pockets of students, like some students in, in the uh, indoor area, some students in the cafeteria, some students in outdoor area. So I think that's part of the issue that the public is concerned about, and they're trying to bring that to our collective awareness. Um, so I think that falls under uh, clarity of communication around safety issues. So those are my um, questions. The other clarifying question for a later time um, actually goes back to Ms. Miller's comment about um, special education at JJAEP. So for folks who aren't familiar with the acronym, I don't remember all the all the letters, but it's essentially the juvenile justice um, uh, program that AISD contract and other surrounding districts contract with. Uh, I want to say Travis County, and they're supposed to provide um, educational services to students who are going through the juvenile justice system. So I would be very interested in hearing an update and a response to Ms. Miller's comments about that. Um, and I wanna echo the same thing about um, staffing ratios and how it's calculated for ALC, um, given that ALC is not a comprehensive school and really looking at how to um, uh, equitably staff uh, ALC. Thank you, trustees, other questions, Trustee Boswell? Um, yes, I want to 
just let my colleagues on the board know that I have sent an, an email to our board council asking for clarity about the minutes and what is required. I want to know if that's the foundation of what we're doing, um, just what the legality is from our council. So I appreciate that. And, and I, my understanding is that well time did count and that it is an implementation and that we had chosen a partnership with Marathon Kids and Go Noodle because it, it aligned with neurosequential knowledge with brain breaks during the day that we knew for teachers and students that there were healthy benefits to that. And I, I absolutely support the idea for more planning time. I remain unconvinced um, based on how much we have heard for months now from people who are on campus um, that this cost of the $8 million in this method is, is one that I'm ready to support. And, and I'd really like to know the foundation of the the legal foundation of, of that requirement before we go there. So um, I just want to thank people who are calling in to share their experience in the classroom. And um, I will continue to ask questions and listen and learn. Thank you. Thank you, trustees. Any other questions? Trustee Singh, any questions? Uh, Trustee Zapata. So, so my question is on Title I uh, allocation of staff because I just want to uh, make sure, is it, are we not in violation of anything assigning Title I staff to non-Title I schools? Um, Title I, so schools that receive uh, Title I dollars, those dollars must remain at that school. Mm -hmm. So if the Title I plan for that campus includes staffing, those staff have to remain only at that campus, um, which is why normally they'll be used to be over and above what the district has already allocated to the campus, if in fact they choose to use it for staff. But campuses, we can't put dollars from a school that's receiving Title I dollars, those positions cannot be moved to a campus that isn't qualifying for Title I dollars. Okay. Okay, so if I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, but last year's budget, we changed the formula that would follow Title I students to other schools. Is that happening, or did that happen, and is that happening again? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question when you say okay. follow the Title I. So there are some schools that don't, don't qualify under the 99% of the students being on free or reduced lunch. That's a Title I school. High number of low um, of uh, students that receive free and reduced lunch. Where there are some schools that had maybe 30, 40 students who qualify for free and reduced lunch but are not at a Title I school. But that school received Title I money because of those 40 students qualifying. No, no we did not use Title I dollars, but, uh, but there, there is a part of what you're asking that we did allocate some additional local resources. Okay. So let me go back. So the federal government allows us to use, if 40% of a campus or more is uh, eligible for free and reduced lunch, that campus can apply for Title I dollars. So we chose to stick with the federal definition of 40% of students, minimum 40% or more receiving free or reduced lunch. They receive Title I dollars. In addition to that, separate from that, at secondary schools where there, is, there are students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch, but it's below the 40%, but above 20%, those schools received an additional individual student by student, and I don't remember the exact amount, but let's just say it was a weight of one point I think it was 1.1. So those students at a school, because we do have schools that are very large that have less than 40% that are receiving 
free and reduced lunch, but the total number of that, the, that group of students is as large or larger than some of our entire schools that are receiving Title I dollars. So for instance, if there's a campus that 500 students at a campus that is not Title I, because it's 20%, not 40%, what we did is for those students, we allocated 10% more for the students that are identified as economically disadvantaged. But that didn't come from title money. It came from our regular budgeting process from an equity standpoint. Okay, all right, thank you. Does that, I yeah. think that's where the two thoughts were coming together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Zapata. Um, trustees, any other questions? I know Trustee Singh has a question. Thank you all. Um, so I wanted to um, address, so I appreciate the question about the ALC formula staffing, and I know that's something that I had brought up once before, um, and I did. I appreciate that the administration responded and did say that ALC had a different staffing formula than our um, comprehensive campuses, so I just wanted to confirm that, that that is the case for that, special education. That is correct. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, and then I had, I wanted to ask some clarifying questions as well about the essential areas design. Um, so I wanted to double check the um, that nearly two thirds of our elementary campuses will get less art and music under this proposed plan um, next year than they did this past school year. That's correct. The parameters that we set out were for them. They're, it's not a campus error, that's, when we have to find the time for physical education, it had to okay, come from that's I just wanted to make sure that that's fine. And then um, have those families of those schools been informed that their students are gonna get less art and music um, next year than they got this past year? No, ma'am. Okay. And then um, I had also asked recently through our tracker, like what kind of rubric or written criteria we had um, to determine whether or not we had sufficient and safe facilities um, to accommodate grade level PE. Since our schools weren't really designed for that and we know we live in a very, um, oh, of a state with very precarious weather. And, um, and so the response was basically that there was not a rubric and that um, Dr. That Gilbert Hicks basically reviewed the plans um, and is approving them. That's correct, because we did them all on okay. a case-by-case -case basis, and so that's what we did. And I think I have to stop my answer at that for now. Okay, appreciate that. And then the last one is, um, I wanted to just second some of the questions that came up about, you know, getting more clarity on the PE. And, um, and if we were to um, actually track and make ensure that's that our family, our teachers are doing wow time, I would like just confirmation that that would actually allow us to be compliant um, with the state um, code. And as you know, and as long as we're talking about compliance, I appreciate that we want to make sure that that is happening. <clears throat> That's important. And at the same time, I want to ensure that we are in compliance with what we need to be doing for special education as well with this plan and having some reassurance that, um, you know, how are, of how our students um, who have special needs are going to still be able to get their IEP minutes and get their adaptive PE and all of that with the staffing that we have, considering that one third of our of our um, teaching vacancies are still in special education. So um, that is something that I would really appreciate some information on, um, considering this is a, a big chunk of the budget that we're set to approve. So our staff just corrected me that in the uh, campuses held um, held PTA meetings, um, parent coffees, and CACs um, throughout the period of time that the campus was developing the plans with regard to the amount of time for all of the courses. And I just want to re-clarify because I did say, yes, if the wow time when I was speaking earlier 
Um, and I, am, I don't think that there's also evidence that supports the teacher that's teaching reading, writing, math, science, social studies, and health should also be teaching um, PE, whether it's in WOW or, or another form. So I don't dispute that there are other ways in which to get the PEs. I don't think that the core elementary teacher is the place to ask them to do that additional work. And that's why we asked campuses to work with their teams then to design different, okay, I know I'm going outside my response time. So um, we'll continue to work on those as well, um, as well as the locations and the space. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trustee Singh. Trustees, any other questions? If not, um, thank you all again for, for the clarification questions. As a reminder to our public, please feel free to share any general comments or questions on non-voting items with the board by email at trustees at austinisd.org. Our next item is under the President's report. And as we've shared during our special meeting two weeks ago, the board plans on adding time to every upcoming information and regular meeting in order to provide an update on the superintendent's transition. Tonight, the board in executive session will review applications for the interim superintendent position. We anticipate naming this individual soon and having them serve up to the summer of 2023. The board will discuss a timeline tonight and post the next interim superintendent meeting on our website and outside the building in alignment with the Texas Open Meetings Act uh, by tomorrow, I believe. And it could be as, er the next meeting could be as early as Monday, this coming Monday. As planned, the meeting will include an opportunity for the public to provide feedback and comments on what the district needs in an interim superintendent and then potentially take action that day. For the most updated information, please visit our district website at austinisd.org backslash board backslash superintendent hyphen search. And for the permanent superintendent search, we hope to start the informal community engagement now post a request for proposals for a superintendent search firm in January 2023, following the board election and possible runoffs, and then select and hire our next superintendent by the summer of 2023. And that ends the superintendent transition update. I do wanna take a point of personal privilege and recognize Trustee Singh before we move to our next item. Thank you, President Rodriguez. Um, so May was um, Asian Pacific American uh, Heritage Month, and I had to say something before the aunties started yelling at me for not doing, not saying something. But um, seriously, though, I just wanted um, to say that the you know history of Asian Americans in the U.S. is an integral part of American history. Uh, you know, from the Chinese immigrants who played and constructing the Transcontinental Railroad during the 1800s to the fight for justice and, and equality through the court cases within the legal system. Asian Americans have shaped um, the history of this country. And I really want to give a special shout out to our AISD employees and families that represent the Asian diaspora. You are shaping America's present and future through your hard work and dedication. And, and I think this board in particular um, you know, when I look, I'm not in the room, but when I when I look around the room, when I am with you in person, I always appreciate how we are diverse and we represent, we look like the community that we serve. And, and I'm so proud because I know each and every one of us advocates for every student in AISD. And really, you know, that is the hope of, of activism and the hope of civic engagement is that we are stronger together. So I thank you for allowing me to, to recognize Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Singh. We're now gonna move on to our information reports and updates. And our first item is the 2022-2023 Student Code of Conduct. Dr. Elisade? 
Thank you, President Rodriguez. I would like to ask our Chief Schools Officer, Dr. Anthony Mays, to introduce the team um, that, or maybe the team of one today. I, I don't know, we have some folks, I think, on, on Zoom because we uh, did make some adjustments so there would be at least space for some individuals physically in our building. So we've got, I think, Mr. Adams that's gonna help us out um, with our increase in COVID levels. We wanted to minimize the number of individuals present physically. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Mays. All right, thank you all. Uh, good evening, President Rodriguez, who's leaving me again. <laughs> Superintendent Elizalde and trustee members. And so uh, this evening, I'm excited to have our team address uh, our student success guide, previously referred to as our student code of conduct. And so we did engage our students uh, in the process where they got to vote on uh, a name and participate in the naming process. So this is where we've landed is our student success guide, which captures our efforts to um, engage our community around guidelines that support our students and families with district discipline, disciplinary guidelines and systems. Um, I want to commend Mr. Adams and Dr. Gloria Williams, I, I'm not sure if she's on Zoom, uh, in our efforts to engage community members at a high level. Uh, I want to thank everybody that's here. I know Trustee Ashy isn't here, but for those of you that gave us suggestions on uh, stakeholder groups that we may you know, touch base with to help uh, bring this product to life, uh, I would say this is a, f a iteration uh, and it's going to always be uh, a living document that continues to involve. Uh, evolve and improve and so um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Adams to get us started. All right, thank you Dr. Mays. Good evening uh, President Rodriguez, Dr. Elizalde, Board of Trustees. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to share an update on the proposed AISD 22-23 Student Code of Conduct. The Student Code of Conduct is the district's response to the requirements of Chapter 37 of the Texas Education Code. The Student Code of Conduct provides educators strategies and guidance for managing students in the classroom and on school grounds. It outlines strategies educators should use to prevent and inter intervene in student misconduct. The law requires that districts define and communicate to students and parents or guardians student behavioral expectations of various kinds of misconduct that may, in some cases, or and must result in disciplinary action. The Student Code of Conduct also protects the rights of all students. It promotes a safe atmosphere and teaches students self-discipline. Next slide. The Texas Education Code requires districts to update the Student Code of Conduct yearly. It is important that we view the Student Code of Conduct as a living document that requires regular attention to meet the immediate needs of students and educators. This slide shows this year's process for updating uh, our 22-23 uh, Student Code of Conduct. We begin by including new legislation, TA laws, and local board policy. Next, we gathered feedback from students, parents, AISD staff, and community stakeholders. Dr. Gloria Williams met monthly with our board policy committee to provide updates on the progress of our revision and we presented to the District Advisory Council in January and April to obtain their feedback. In April, we submitted the proposed draft for review to our legal office, chief of staff, and superintendent. And this evening, I'm excited to be here to present the proposed and new student code of conduct to the Board of Trustees. Next slide. Last school year, the Equity Office created a community retreat partnership between six AISD central office departments and community stakeholders to work collaboratively to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. The student support service work group began meeting last year to revise the student code of conduct. And this year, the work group met monthly to continue this work. As I shared earlier, we, per, we uh, regularly reported out to the board policy committee to make sure that we were on the correct pathway as we updated uh, this year's edition. This slideshow shows the stakeholders who contributed to this year's revision and update. Throughout the year, we participated in 24 in-person meetings to a total of 493 stakeholders. This was nearly double the amount of feedback we received compared to last year. Based on the long-standing concerns shared over the years, 
it was critical that we spent a considerable amount of time engaging with stakeholders to ensure we heard we were headed in the right direction and we heard voices throughout the city. In addition, we had a new team, including myself, working on this year's project. The time we spent listening and learning from stakeholders was extremely valuable and beneficial to all of us as we learned a lot. As a means to collect feedback and disaggregate the information, a district survey was created and provided to those we met with in person, as well as it was shared with students, parents, and staff in our weekly district newsletter. In January, we provided secondary schools with a two-day advisory lesson to help students become more knowledgeable of the Student Code of Conduct. Many teachers completed the survey as a collective class so that students would have opportunity to capture uh, and share input. Uh, we're still not on the, still on the previous slide. We also held in-person meetings with students from the Alternative Learning Center, our PALS classes, and students from the, and the Student Equity Council. The table on the right shows that 1,659 stakeholders partic participated in our survey this year. It was optional for participants to identify their role or demographic, but those that did are indicated in this table. Next slide. The full survey results are found on the District Student Code of Conduct webpage. The survey provided a lot of insight, so I wanna spend a few minutes just talking about some of the information that we learned. 85% of participants indicated it was not difficult to locate the student code of conduct. 74% of the participants indicated that it was not difficult to read. However, we did conclude that we needed to improve the organization, use of plain language, and overall structure of the document. Most respondents indicated they read the student code of conduct to understand student rights or specific policy as it pertained to their child or school. This information was helpful because it let us know we needed to create a section and a platform around the topics parents and students had the most questions. Participants shared the best way to learn about the Student Code of Conduct with, was the district's newsletter, an email from the campus, or on social media. Next slide. Based on the information we learned, our work group identified three areas of focus, improve the readability, incorporate a restorative practice model, and explicitly provide more information about student and parent rights. Before going to the next slide, I wanna point out the new cover and title of the Student Code of Conduct that Dr. May shared, which is our uh, student success guide, and I'll share a little bit more. Uh, we can actually go to the next slide. So when you read the Student Code of Conduct this year, you'll notice that it reads vastly different from previous year's edition. This is a result of the investment from stakeholders over the last two years, many who spent time going line by line through the Student Code of Conduct to make sure it communicates our district vision. I want to highlight some of the major changes in this year's edition. The Board Policy Committee asked for students to suggest a new title. And I'm proud to share that students from Crockett High School's PAL class provided uh, the new title of Student Success Guide. The document has a new cover page with AISD students and programs. It has a new interactive table of content that will allow readers to quickly access sections they wish to reach. Hyperlinks were added throughout the document to connect readers with resources or supporting documentation. Three new sections were added to clearly outline student rights and responsibilities, parents and guardians responsibilities, and district employee responsibilities. At this year's August board meeting, one trustee asked for consideration to move the prevention and intervention supports to the front of the document. This update was included and it helps the document to read as a resource for prevention and intervention rather than a document of punitive consequences. I'm excited to share that we included a restorative practice model. Five years ago, AISD received a restorative practice grant to implement restorative practices in 11 schools and collect data around the implementation. The restorative practice grant coordinator and associates took what was learned from this research 
and led a work group to incorporate this information in the Student Code of Conduct. This section is helpful as it brings awareness and understanding of restorative practices and allows educators to begin utilizing the principles. Next school year, we will have two new district-funded restorative practice coordinators who will use this research as a launching point to implement restorative practices in schools. Next, I want to highlight the more resources and information that more resources and information was added to our bullying and sexual harassment section. Trustee Singh was instrumental in helping us by, uh, to include more information and resources by facilitating a meeting with Safe Alliance and Expect Respect. This section includes a hyperlink to a district webpage with resources and information. This allows us to update the content and resources regularly so parents and students have access to the most current information and resources. Also included is a new frequently asked questions section that includes the most common questions we received uh, from our in-person meeting with stakeholders. This section includes a link to the Student Code of Conduct page. On this webpage, stakeholders can now submit questions to a live frequently asked question document that we can maintain throughout the year and um, to help keep uh, to answer those questions that are um, important at that moment or that need more clarification. Collectively, we are working to create systems and processes to help make the Student Code of Conduct a living document and resource. Next slide. So this final slide shows the next steps to communicate the Student Code of Conduct updates to our, in our process for updating the 23-24 Student Code of Conduct. Principals and assistant principals will receive an outline of the changes at the June 28th Summer Leaders Leadership Institute. Teachers will rece receive an overview during their August 8th in-service training. Students will engage in an advisory lesson within the first two weeks of school in August. We are meeting with parent support specialists in August to review the Student Code of Conduct so that they can assist with sharing information with our families. In September, the Student Support Service Community Work Group will reconvene meeting to continue the work of disrupting the school to prison pipeline and, and working on revi uh, revisions for the 23 uh, Student Success Guide. This meeting is open to anyone that would like to join this effort and last, we've added the student, uh, student Success Guide as one of our agenda items for our CAC meetings uh, across the district in October. Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity for, to uh, share information on the 22-23 Student Code of Conduct. So thank you, Dr. Elizalde, uh, and trustee members, we're now open for questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Adams and Dr. Mays and your teams for the thoughtful updates to the Student Success Guide. I like saying that. Uh, trustees, are there any questions? Trustee Anderson? Um, thank you so much for this presentation. A couple of questions. Um, is there a, uh, will, they, will there be a FAQ guide? And this is going to be part of my question. So under expectation for student behavior, confiscation of items that disrupt the educational process. So when I, when I read that, I thought it was kind of open-ended. And what I mean by that is, <coughs> say I'm a student, I got a, a project, I take it in the class, and it's fascinating to other students. But the teacher decides that it's a disruption and wants to confiscate it. So who determines what's disruptive? If, if this is part, if the project is part of my educational process, but I, I have to take it into the class because it's my next class, right? But it's confiscated because other students think my project is awesome. Like, is there gonna be a list in the FAQ of items that will be deemed a disruption? because I can see that going bad really quickly. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Trustee Anderson. 
Uh, what we've uh, done, and I've, you submitted that feedback, is we've actually included the link um, of prohibited items, which is on page 42 of the Student Code of Conduct, to that section. So we have uh, that information, and it's clear to uh, our educators. Um, that's also, you know, training with our teachers working collaboratively so that if they know that there's a project, that students may have those items in the class and that, you know, they, they need to work collaboratively together to make sure that it's not a disruption. But we have included a link so that we have um, explicitly identified what are those prohibited items at school. Thank you. Uh, my next question is under general violations of rules miscellaneous. Uh, repeated, repeatedly violating communicated campus or classroom standards of behavior. So, say I'm in a class and the teacher doesn't necessarily care for me. And maybe she thinks or he thinks my behavior, I'm leaning to the side, but they want me to sit up. You know, maybe I'm not paying attention, giving eye contact at what's being taught, but I am listening. So, if, if the classroom standard is for me to provide eye contact and I'm not providing that, and boom, I'm sent to the principal's office. So is there something in the FAQ that says what classroom standards of behavior look like? Because behavior for me, or what I think is, is good behavior and what someone else thinks is good behavior could be totally different. So how would that, maybe not in the FAQ, but how would that be communicated to teachers on behavior? Just because I'm not giving eye contact, you know, listening to a lesson doesn't mean I'm not paying attention, and it could be seen as disrespectful and me not paying attention and it escalating. So how would something like that be addressed? I'm gonna start and then I'll let Mr. Adams jump in here because I think this is exactly the type of overarching training we have to do because that's really not a code of conduct, or I'm sorry, I need to call it our new- um, Student success guide. Success guide. Um, where is our um, cultural competency training, cultural relevancy? We have to be aware, something as simple as eye contact. There are a variety we used to think of it even only as there might be cultures that don't use eye contact as, as a method of respect, and in fact, it could be disrespectful, but it goes beyond just cultural. It goes to knowing each of our students um, because it's not all, whatever cultures are not all the same either. So I think the more we embed, which I know is part of the training early on in the school year, um, the equity training, the cultural relevancy, the cultural proficiency, and then most importantly is the dialogue and the conversation before we begin any type of punitive consequences. It's let me understand what is going on and what are the expectations I have as a classroom teacher and why, and what are the expectations that the student has of, of his or her teacher. And so I think all of that will be wrapped into as we develop the classroom expectations training session that will take place for teachers and support staff at the beginning of the year. Yeah, Dr. Elizalde just kind of, we, we touched on it even at graduation, how different, you know, seniors would come across and, and greet us uh, and how that was different. But we have those same conversations. I always say, you see Mr. Adams, you should also see an extension in uh, Ms. Costa's team because we all sit around in terms of CPNI, uh, Dr. Ross, and have those conversations about it can look different from, depending on your, your implicit bias, it can look different. So how do we define that? And I know Mr. Adams can drill down a little more, but those conversations do take place so we can try to give guidance for teachers. So that, that, yeah. that leads right into the next one. Failure to comply. Failure to comply with directives given by school personnel. Like, when I hear that, <laughs> if somebody were to, t you better comply. What? So how are we planning to address that? When I hear the word comply, um, I, I, yeah. It, it is, how do we plan to address that so that, <coughs> A student, 
Well, we, we, a teacher and a student has that line of communication when a student does something wrong, they can be redirected, as opposed to a teacher saying, hey, I told you to do this, you better comply, which I've never heard nobody say that. I hope they're not saying that. But how do we get to a place where we're not using the words failure to comply? Like that, that, how we, what, what's the plan for communication to get some students and teachers to a place where if there's a behavior that needs to be addressed, it's not coming off as a dictator, but more so to correct a behavior. Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the things that we did was, you know, we spent a lot of time working on the language. And as we work to use plain language, sometimes we lost the meaning or it, it created a, a new meaning. Um, but I think the one thing that we really try to do is when you look at our restorative practice and how it explains the tiers, uh, one of the things that it, it starts with is the teacher working collaboratively with his or her students to create those respect agreements in the classroom. The campus working with students to create respect agreements. What does respect from teacher to student look like? What does respect from student to teacher, from peer to peer? So really working collaboratively so that they have those uh, those norms and that foundation uh, and it's developed with the students and the teachers. Um, that's gonna be the work that our restorative practice coordinators are gonna do as we identify which campuses we need to start with the implementation. So uh, one of the things that we really wanted to make sure was we had that restorative practice piece incorporated in there and that we now start utilizing those because it's not until we start having our teachers and students, um, which they're already doing, but really working collaboratively that, that we'll see the, uh, that we won't have those issues of compliance. And I would add that this would be one of those um, like the others that you've pointed out, that we'll be monitoring closely in terms of what are the referral rates that we're getting that are having failure to comply. Um, because it's indicative of where we need to provide support if there's, like if I'm a classroom teacher and I'm referring half of my students and all of them are saying failure to comply, what kind of support do I need as a classroom teacher? Um, but I think it, you make an excellent point. Some of it is to be like clear with the language because in most of these instances we're talking about there should be like short periods of time for decision making. Let's think about like a safety situation where I'm like I need all of you to go to the back of the room, uh, especially given recent circumstances. So I think bringing forward the idea that there are certain times but the only way a student is gonna know to trust me if I'm the classroom teacher is if I've built up a relationship with them um, and that this should always, let's say there is an issue with failure to comply, then what's the multi-tiered approach? We Again, we start with what was the lack of compliance, why? We start with the why, not what are we gonna do because they didn't comply. And so I think all of our student input helped us to design this entire piece, which is not perfect, as Dr. Mays mentioned. I do think it, it, it looks and has verbiage in there that is very different than what we're accustomed to seeing, and I applaud the entire team. I think this is going to be one of the groundbreaking pieces that other districts are gonna use and as, as a way in which they can start. Um, but these areas that, that you're pointing out, I would ask our public and our community to point those out to us as well so we can continue to monitor we're going to need to be more explicit in the language or we need to give more examples in this language. And at the end of the day, all of this needs to be framed around the, the entire process is about what the name of this is. It's a student's success. It's to set our students up to be successful, not let me wait, let me watch them do something bad and now I'm going to punish. Discipline should be something we do for students, not to them, so that they ultimately become self-managers. But the ones you've pointed out, as I've made note, and I know Dr. Mays has too, I think we need to pay particular attention to whether we start seeing those as some areas that need additional training and additional wording. 
the shameless plug I would make is this is where the coaching model takes place, right? And, and this is where growing the capacity with the restorative coaches is going to support the work that Mr. Adams is doing on the team. Um, I think the other piece, you know, Miss, shout out to Miss uh, Emily Sawyer because I know that she's been engaged in this process the entire time. Uh, they're constantly looking at, like you said, little stuff like that. How do you tweak the language? What do you need to do? And the, com the committee is pretty robust. And I know that this is, again, this is an iteration that's going to continue to evolve. So. I, you know, despite pointing what I pointed out, like, this came a long way from when I first read it. So, you know, thank you for all your hard work, Mr. Adams, and, and those who um, provided feedback on it. Trustee Boswell. Um, thank you, and I want to just echo what Trustee Anderson said um, and about the thanks. First of all, to you, Mr. Adams, everyone within the district who's worked on this, Dr. Mays, to Dr. Ellis all day for really supporting an ecosystem to surround this, that it's not just the, the document, but it is the whole ecosystem that's growing up around this, and, and it's incredibly powerful work. And really thank all the people in the community who showed up to be part of this. And if we look at our equity decision-making frameworks, who's at the table? What are we trying to solve and for whom? And then looking ahead to how are we going to know that it's working? And we have all the pieces in place for that. Um, and, and really excited um, that this is a living document. I love the living FAQ. That's a great idea. I'm really excited to see as things come up that haven't been anticipated that they have a place to land and go. The links to, to make the document um, more usable, understandable, just all the work. And if I look at our, our values here, you know, I think the, the process and the product both really reflect our values, caring for every child to be healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. Every educational equity to ensure every child receives what is needed, innovation, diversity, inclusion, meeting, meaningful engagement as we collaborate to improve the common good, culture of respect, transparency, data-informed decision-making, engaging our employees and inviting collaboration. All of these things are really embedded not only in the process, but now in the product. Um, so I just want to express my thanks and my enthusiasm um, for all of that. And I will say, and this has come to us several times in the policy committee um, with Trustee Foster and Trustee Ashley and I, and, and Trustee Ashley, um, I will try to channel her enthusiasm. I'm not very good at that, a little more low key, but I cannot tell you how thrilled we have all been and just how complimentary of everyone who's been involved in this. So I'm just, as you said, I think this is one of those times when we are leading the way. Um, and I, I, Austin has that capacity and I'm, I'm really just appreciative and proud of all that everyone's done to get us there. So thank you for that. And um, just one question, I wanna be sure that um, Mr. Adams, Dr. May, is that everyone who's worked on this has seen the recommendations that have come from some of the community members who've been in, some of the organiz organizations that have been involved um, in creating this to, to and basically have, have, have emailed all of us and I think probably you to say we, we know this is a, a great document and we have some ideas for making it better and wondering what your thoughts are about those ideas so for us like you said we got that same correspondence the previous year and if you'll notice that this year's iteration reflects a lot of the feedback that we got as we started that process and so because we're evolving in that process guess what next year's you know version will have even more of the suggestions and so um, I would just say that you know we, we take all of that to heart and we continue to embed it in the work that we're doing as we move forward uh, and we just ask everybody to again be patient and stay dialed in Thank you. Trustee Luca. So yes, much appreciation to um, Superintendent Elizalde and Dr. Mays and Mr. Adams, as well as all the, sorry, I forgot. As well as all the folks that um, have participated in this process um, over the years, but especially this year, um, it looks just 180 right from where it was um it's easier to read um one thing and i appreciate the kind of um measured expectations that that uh are being provided to the community and, and to students at large 
um, you know, like this is going to be iterative, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to keep working on it. Um, there is one and I'm trying to find it and I bet I won't be able to, but there is one section that I was reading and it has to do with, um, when students are questioned by, I believe it's like SROs or AISD PD. Um, and I want to say that the language pretty much indicates that that the student could be questioned without a, a guardian or a parent or a next friend. And so I'm wondering, um, is that something that would be addressed before next year? Or is that like, how is that being addressed? So Mr. Adams, I know that we've been engaged in that dialogue, so I'll let you pick that up because I know we've had pretty much robust conversation around that. Uh, and I forgot where we put the pin in that particular subject. So go ahead. Sure. So uh, that was one of the topics that we spent a lot of time uh, recently discussing. Um, we met with several of the advocacy groups. Um, our uh, chief attorney, uh, Mr. Rosenberg, uh, Barry also met with them, and we were able to add in some additional language to bring clarity to that. So uh, in the student code of conduct, you'll see there's a language that says, except when a student is placed under arrest, in any interview of a student conducted by a police officer will be non-custodial in nature. So this language was added to bring clarity to that. Um, and again, you know, we recognize there's still some work around that language, and that will be the work that will be undertaken as we move forward with uh, our work group. Thank you. Can you point me to that page? Because I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. Yes. It's under, one second. Dr. Mace, did you want to add something to that? Well, I, I was just remembering, you know, our conversation around like, okay, if you're talking to a student and they happen to disclose something happening and it's not, you know, you're not, you hadn't been Mirandized or anything like that, should you be held punished? You know, you, should you be punished after the fact that I just disclosed something? So we were, yeah, we were going all around the barn and under the bridge and over the mountains with like all the different scenarios that can play out in that instance, so. And, and we uh, did seek some legal advice on the Mirandizing portion specifically, because actually if our licensed peace officers Mirandize, then it actually places the student actually more at risk because it does become a law enforcement, um, like if it was Austin PD. So we're like, no, no, no. Because uh, first you think about, well, why aren't they being protected by it? But when, again, that's the whole difference between school um, peace officers and regular city police. And so it, we don't want it to turn into that. So initially it was like we were missing something in that language. And then after seeking legal, we're like, well, actually, then you do put the student in a situation where anything they say can be used against them. If they haven't been Mirandized, they actually have a whole lot more protections. Um, and we wanna gather information, particularly if it's about helping them or other students. So I don't know that we have it, I don't yeah. know that we have all of that language down right. I know we're taking it step at a time to make sure that again, this has to be a focus on what we're doing for our students, not gotchas, Here, we're, here's how we're gonna get them. And Trustee Lugo, that uh, language is on page 23. It's under the uh, safety and security, the district's right to interview students. You'll notice that the, that new language was added in that uh, um, section after the uh, recent meetings we had with uh, those community advocates. Okay, great. I think I'll probably have a follow-up question, but I'll um, submit it through the, the tracker. Um, and one last, there's a point of privilege, just got to say it. So I have uh, an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old and a four-year-old, right? So um, this past school year, there was an incident and um, uh, an adult came by to interview the kiddos. And um, my youngest and my eldest, you know, they were just like, oh yeah, I'm going to answer all the questions. And my eight-year-old said, wait a minute, what is this about? And I'm like, that's my baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's all contextual, right? Like, and, and to the extent that we can make it a book about success and, you know, really protecting both the rights of the students and then the safety of our schools and our staff and our students. So I, I completely get that it's a complex issue. So thank you all for working on it. So maybe that's a future law student and uh, attorney or judge. 
right. Trustee Zapata. Thank you, and uh, I really liked the titles because I think this will also help uh, do things that we didn't may maybe not think about, like the culture of the campus. You know, once students begin to see this as a positive student success guide, well, that probably is going to want them to read it. Uh, and so there's, I mean, this is something that's been, uh, uh, first let me ask for clarification. Did you say that the first three days of school, they will be reading this book or introduced to it? Did I hear you say that? Within Dr. the first Mitchell? two weeks. With, within the first two weeks oh, okay. of school, uh, you know, each campus has their own schedule, so okay. we want to make sure that they can plan accordingly. But I want to reiterate, it is our expectation that we actually set time within those first two weeks so that we can have some guidance lessons around it rather than the typical, here it is, there's the end of the, sign the page, very, right. you know, very perfunctory rather than engaging, but we're not right. mandating exactly what time right. or how, but we do expect it to be done within the first two weeks of school. Yes, ma'am. And it would be good to engage those students that were part of creating this for their campuses. Like, I think it's key for student leaders like the cheerleaders, the, the football, um, for them to all, not all of them, but the, the captains or, student council that that they teach this in a fun way uh, and so that they are the ones that can call on someone and say hey you know on student conduct you can't do this or whatever so it doesn't become a, a, a punitive thing but it's just everyone kind of holding each other accountable to make sure that they don't get in trouble uh, so that's being more prevent using some prevention skills um, and I I just can't talk enough about the expect respect uh, curriculum that um, safe Alliance uses um, and a lot of times the students that went into those groups were because they got in trouble it was after effect and so students saw that as Oh, you're here because you got in trouble. No, the whole school should have the same um, teaching uh, because um, a lot of kids are learning from the streets, you know, and, and so it's time to create that, that, that con consistent and collective and equitable for everyone to learn it. Uh, so that no one is set up to fail. And so um, however way you can engage in those and that expect respect, because they have it for parents, they have it for students, they have it for staff, you know, it's, it's universal. And that's creating the culture, a safe culture, uh, a respectful culture, uh, where hopefully the, the bullying goes away, the, all that hate goes away. <laughs> Uh, but using this uh, tool as something that's living and breathing every day on campus, uh, that people understand it. And even if there's a, a pledge that students would sign at the back, I've read it and I, I commit or I agree, there's been some of those kinds of uh, pledges made in, in districts so that everyone, I mean, they do it as a, I remember the drill team at, at, at the high school, uh, one of the high schools, they had a pledge and I thought everyone should say that. We're all, they're all pledging to, to be, be respectful, to help each other and, you know, so maybe there's something that we could do with this uh, 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 student success guide as well as a pledge that we're all working together as a campus uh, as students. Um, to make this a safe and 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 uh, safe and uh, you know relational with our peers and you know those kinds of things because we need those. You can go into a school and you can feel when there's spirit and when there's not. And so um, I just wanted to to add those those comments. Thank you. Trustees, any other questions, Trustee Foster? I just wanted to um, 
thank uh, the whole team uh, who's been involved in, in this. Um, sitting on the policy committee, not the committee meetings or, you know, there's a lot of them and, but, or and, um, sitting on the policy committee meeting with trustees Ashy and Boswell, um, as it was kind of brought up, we, we watched as, as Dr. Williams and others came to us each you know, month and sort of reported the process. And um, there were a couple of things that were really noteworthy. One is immediately there was a commitment to really rethinking and reframing um, this code of conduct around something more affirmative and empowering and speaking of possibility rather than constraints and punishments and such. That was there on day one. And then um, as Trustee Ashy or Trustee Boswell would say, you know, what about engaging this group? We'd come back in a month and that had happened. Um, and it happened in really powerful, substantive ways. And you could tell they were substantive ways because we would get these tables and reports and here are the numbers and here are the comments. And uh, so it was just wonderful to watch, as Trustee Boswell put it, the process. And true to form, process did lead to, as you said, product, where this is something that is emerging into something where I'm, I'm actually really proud, even as I see um, I still see AJC saying, eh, but what about this? And then I'm like, yeah, what, what about that? That's right, that's a great point. But then I see, and then Superintendent uh, Elizalde's comment about, well, here was, and your comment, here's the back and forth. So this process seemed to me to have gone very well, um, and indeed as a model, um, including the, 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 the slight spaces where things might not at the end of the day look exactly like each constituency group wants it to look. If we're thoughtful, if there's a reason, like I don't know where this Miranda stuff falls because I'm immediately like, you know, we gotta protect and then I'm immediately like, whoa, don't put us in the system, you know, so, the, but having that debate be something that the community can transparently engage, then even if community members disagree, they're gonna get, you know what? They thought it through. We're still not on the same page, but I respect where they are. I respect what they were trying to do, and we can work with this. So I just really want to, um, I guess, pile on the cheerleading uh, side on, on this day. Um, but I also, I guess, lastly want to pick up on something, and this is the, you know, this is the Debbie Downer side from that Saturday Night Live skit, if any of y'all saw that, where there's the person that always has to bring the bad. Um, I do really appreciate what uh, Trustee Anderson raised up about the soft areas. The soft areas are where we run into problems, which is to say, what's compliance? What's defiance? These words that become the catch-alls that catch kids up are, uh, remain our sticky areas. But if we have formative documents that are touchstone, that they're anchored in our values, those things can become, um, dare I say, our scripture in a sense. And that can guide our practices and help us get better in those soft areas where we can concretely say, if you notice in our student success guide, we actually caution against such and such. And we actually encourage these restorative practices, et cetera. And now you have some way to point an errant teacher who's kind of getting it wrong in the moment. You have somewhere to uh, point them to. But I will always be, at least probably for the next couple of years, always worried about those soft areas and hopeful that our success guides offer the space of correction. So um, thank you for, for this document. And this of, of the things we've done this year, this has been one that's been a pleasure to be a part of observing its unfolding. Thank you for the, the questions, trustees, and thank you, Dr. Mays and Mr. Adams, for all your work on this, along with uh, you know, Ms. Casas and the rest of the teams that have been involved as well. So our next item is our regular update on the redistricting process. Tonight, we are joined virtually with our partners at Thompson & Horton and our demographic partners, Zonda Education. And good evening, Ms. McIntosh. Uh, could you please provide an update for us this evening? 
I don't know if we have audio from Ms. McIntosh just yet. Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, okay, so Rocky is sharing his screen to give us our PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Wanted to, what we're going to do today is go over Plan 5, which Plan 5 result, it was the, the latest iteration of the plan, and it is um, our recommended final plan with just a few tweaks that we expect to make that shouldn't impact um, that should have little impact that Rocky will get into when he goes over the final map um, that uh, to make sure to to avoid splitting some precincts, some voting precincts across districts where they went, they, for example, went across the street. Um, and, and so we just, you know, we need to like go on from one side of the highway to the other side of the highway in terms of where we draw the map, but it doesn't really impact homes. And so Rocky is gonna talk to you a little bit further about that. But with those few tweaks, we expect this to be what we recommend, this is what we recommend to be the final map. Um, and this takes into consideration some concerns that we heard um, addressed by trustees in our meetings. And so I, before he gets going on to, I'm gonna, most of this time is gonna be Rocky talking about that map, but I wanna briefly um, just remind you how we got here. Um, again, these are the steps that we've, you've seen this timeline every time we've gone and it shows you, you know, all the work that the district has done to get to this point. Um, you started back in October of 2021 by hiring um, our teams, um, you received a, a brief on the on what this process would look like in November of 2021. You provided input um, on how on how the how we should get input from you, right? Uh, going forward on substantive input and how we should get community input. Um, and you also reviewed we reviewed this timeline that we're going over right now. It, on, in January, all in January. Um, and then we received, you received a, a redistricting 101, a legal overview of the requirements on February 10th. Um, and you were briefed on, by Rocky and his team on the relevant census population, demographic and election data. Um, you reviewed the public input proposal that we prepared. You, and, um, and then we immediately began implementing that proposal. Public education materials were released on the website and in the community in early March. Um, we had a survey on redistricting criteria up in March. The district put that survey up and there was public com there, there has been the ability to make public comment at board meetings. Um, redistricting criteria were adopted um, in at the March meeting. The demographer um, drafted and presented an initial proposed map that was just to get us to that 10% um, variation as an initial starting point. And that was also presented then. Um, since that time, we had two virtual town halls and that's actually what we called for. We had two, but we actually have three because if you remember at the last meeting, we were directed to have one more virtual meeting and one in-person meeting. So we actually had three virtual town halls and one, um, in-person town hall this this past Saturday. There was there have been surveys on each of the proposed maps. Um, so either on each of the one, maps one through five have had a survey up on the website for people to look at and comment on. And the board and the public have provide, been, a, been given the opportunity to provide input on each iteration of the map as we come before you and present them at the board. And we have had meetings between, uh, maybe not weekly, but regular meetings between the legal team and the demographic team and the board president and Dr. Reach. And we have had um, a series of three um, virtual and two in-person trustee-led meetings in the individual trustee districts, um, individual districts. Um, and then we have also, in addition to that, had three presented at three community meetings um, for organizations in the community that asked us to present or asked the trustees and the trustees, a trustee asked us. Um, and then we have had multiple one-on-one -on -one meetings with the trustees as you have come forward to us to tell us things that you're hearing from your constituents. And, um, and so then we um, are now here at June 9th presenting the um, proposed final map. And then just so you know kind of what's coming next, I want to just to keep complete the process and timeline piece. Um, one, one 
uh, one thing that has been on here as a potential for a while is the idea of having a special board meeting on this. I don't think there will be a there. We haven't there has not been a special called meeting, and I don't think there is um, is time to between now and June 23rd if you wanted to have one. However, um, there has been some. I wanted to make the board aware that there has been some feedback at the at the last community meeting. There were some concerns by some of the attendees that that meeting um, was not um, that they didn't feel like it it received enough publication um, and or that there were difficulties um, coming to the meeting. And so some some people had come were um, asking for yet another community meeting. And we just wanted to let you know that one option that is available if the board wanted to hold another meeting, but no, but there's not time for another community meeting, um, would be a, one one option is to have a hearing. So to conduct the net, the meeting on June 23rd as a hearing, um, um, it, whether that is in addition to an additional community meeting or instead of a an additional community meeting, um, and that way people could testify on the map at that hearing, um, and and they would be able. And of course, they're obviously going to be able to talk to you at that here at that meeting anyway, because it'll be on the agenda. So that will be a way. That would be a way for the board to hear more directly from the public about um, about the maps ahead of making a final decision on whether to adopt. Um, but if the board agrees with our recommendation, then the board would adopt the final plan through resolution next um, board meet at the next board meeting, or you will have the opportunity to vote on it and adopt it. And then um, that will be, that if the board adopts it, it will be adopted a month ahead of the first day to file for place on the ballot. So we will be um, well within our deadlines. And I'm going to turn it over to Rocky. Good evening. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Is that a yes? Can, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, awesome. Great. Um, I'm going to go through these pretty quick as usual. You guys kind of know my, my style here, but feel free to stop me or we can talk about them at the end. We want to start by just going back a little bit and just remind everyone where we came from with the 2010 census. In 2010, there were 635,000 persons in Austin ISD, your largest district was district was district three, four, I'm sorry, your, your smallest district was district one, and your deviation was about 7.7%. Fast forward 10 years, and it did go fast, 736,448 persons now reside in Austin ISD. Your largest district was now district six at 124,000, and district two was your smallest district with 93,000 persons. So that's a that was a di differential of 33.6 percent. So that was our obvious trigger to redistrict, and we averaged was about 105,000. So keep that in mind as well. This is a change map that just shows the growth. You can see there again that District Six um, grew by more than any other district, adding over 30,000 persons dur during the decade. So that created the the need to draw a plan and just. And just to get you here, you know, we drew our first in initial plan of our plan one that was just met the criteria. Plan two was following some meetings. Plan three was actually a, a plan that, that one of the, tr the trustees um, helped us build or asked us to build. And then plan four, we were narrowing things down. And then this is plan five that was kind of the result of walking through all these steps. So this is plan five, and just a quick reminder, the blue line that you see is, is are your current boundaries, and the, uh, the the colors are the plan's boundaries. So where they bleed under a, a blue line, that means that boundary is shifting there. The, we highlighted where these shifts were. Again, we're just showing here the change from plan, well, it, it's mostly the changes from plan five to, to plan five from plan four to plan five, but also some from, from plan two to four as well, that, that then be, that rolled into five. So this plan, again, is it ends up with 7.3%. Your largest district is, is now district one with 108,000 persons, and your smallest district is district two with 100,000 persons. Both these districts had to see significant gains, and keep in mind, district six, what we had to remove significant numbers of, po of population. So you can see here the result of that, of, of those gains and district five, I mean, in plan five. So I'm gonna go through these one at a time, 
some of these um, files are a little bit redundant because in plan one and plan three, it's the same change. So I'll move pretty quickly through those. So in, in district one, single member district one, this is where we moved west of the of 35 and picked up some population from district three, Grady, Grady, Grady Drive to the north, 1A3 to the south. And, and then I believe that was Lamar that we uh, that we that we went to on on the um, on that western edge there. As a matter of fact, I know that was Lamar. So that was the change there. And then we also ha had a change down the south, where a part of District One along Oak Springs Drive was moved into District Two. The the end result of all five of these plans, you, you guys can each see the transition where we started with the ninety four thousand. We had 102,000 in the in the in the first plan. We ended up right over 108,000 in Plan One. You can see. Keep in mind, we also are showing voting age population, and of course, the all important citizen voting age population. You can see that the trend here that that, that we had um, our changes each year. This is 2020. We we know that your populations, that your Anglo population, stayed right around 40 percent. Asian population stayed pretty consistent. Our African American population was 23.9%. We got it to 23.8%. So relatively the, the same population. And of course, Hispanic, which was growing any in this district significantly, went from 292 to 302 So pretty, pretty similar trends there. If we go to single member district two. This is the pink lines that you see there. A couple of these, this was just shown in District 1, that this move on Oak Springs. If we go to the south here, this is where we moved Travis Early College and the grab, grab prep on the other side of th 35. These campuses were in District 2. Were, I'm sorry, we're not in di District 2. We moved them to District 2 for this plan. And then you can see in the southern part of District 2, this is where we brought in a lot of population, where we, we had to gain population, keeping in mind that we had to we had to gain a lot of population in District 2, and we couldn't go north into 1. This is Slaughter Lane, Old Lockhart Road. So just to give you some perspective of where that change was there in Single Member District 2. In Single Member District 2, we went from 93,000 to just over 100,000 with Plan 5. Oh, if you look there, at their, their Hispanic population was 46.8. This final plan sits at 49.8, so roughly 50% of the population is now Hispanic in District 2. Single member district three. So in single member district three, you can this change here off of Grady and Lamar that, that moved to district one. And then in the south there, we had Burnett Road on the west and then Koenig Road on the south that went from district four to district three. And then we had another section there that this is a uh, Guadalupe Road here, and this is Dean Keaton. So another section of district five that we moved into district three to, to add that population there. District three was sitting at hundred was sitting at one hundred one thousand in twenty twenty. We, we we didn't have to grow it a lot to get back to our our, our average. We ended with one hundred seven thousand two hundred fourteen with our final plan five there. If I move on to district four, single member di di district four. The, the, this is where district four gave up some population to district three. We we, we just saw that slide, and then we see the section here of district four that went south. This is twenty fourth street. Here, the, this is South Lamar that kind of zigzags through here, and then you have Shoal Creek as, as well. So that's the area that moved from five into four to pick up some population for four there. And if we look at wh where that was, four was sitting right at 106,000. With this, this change, the back and forth that we had there, it settled in right at 106,290. And really following the plan two, we didn't make any changes to plan four in plans four or five. We move, move move on to single member district five. This is the areas that we were just showing that moved from five in, in into three and four here along 24th and, and Dean Koenig. And then we have an area five here. This is Oldorf on, on the, if I say that, hope I say that right. Oldorf Street and on the south, you can see there that the, this was all moved into five from district six. Keep it in mind, we had to move significant population from, from district six in this, in, in this redrawing of, of your districts. District 5's population was 109,000. We settled in right at 103,700 there in, in, in the fifth plan. Again, this is another one that didn't change after plan two. D District 5 stayed the same there. 
and District 6, the one where we had to change a lot of population. This is the first change. You've seen most of these changes because they were moved in previous, in some of the previous districts there. These, these are the campuses that were moved into District 2 from 6. And then we have a, a, a large part on the east side of 35 off Slaughter and Lockhart that was moved from 6 into 2. And then we did have a section here off Jones Road to the south and Westgate on the west that moved from District 7 into District 6. So we did move some back into 6 right along, um, again, right along Westgate. And, and a little bit here, th th this is in Menchaca Road. We, we extended District 6 over to Menchaca Road. And this ac actually made for a really clean line, picked up some, uh, some areas there. So with District 6, again, we were sitting at 124,000. We, we made these changes and District 6 settled in right at 106,946 fo following those adjustments. And finally, District 7. District 7, you, you can see here, and a few of these changes, the Jones Road change there, Westgate, and, and the area off Menchaca. So two areas where we moved districts from District 7 to District 6. The result of that um, was taking District 7 from 107,000 down to about 103,000. So not a significant number and, and it didn't really impact any of their other areas from a, a share perspective as well. So I want, want, want to mention one more thing um, for, before we follow up. This plan five is, is, the, is a plan that we are recommending, but as we go in and review this final plan, we begin to see some little, there's little slivers. The way the Census Bureau um, designed census blocks was a challenge. Some little things can kind of sneak through. So we will be going back and looking at some of these. I wanted to show you just an example that where voting precincts get split. If we can kind of clean them up a little bit, we will. So I, I just want to show you one here in the far south of, this is a, this is actually district seven. This is voting precinct number 335. See, it's a little, a little green sliver down, down there. That was inadvertently put there. We'll move that back into District 7. There's zero population there. And we have several areas like that throughout the district. You can see this line here where I have this green circle. Again, this is an area, two areas here where we can do a little cleanup. And that way the voting precinct is not technically split. Now, there, were, there are some areas that were split and there's really not anything we can do about it. The population is significant. The change was needed and it will continue to be split. So that's kind of what I was trying to show you there with that red line is that we did have some areas that this is a cleanup about 15 to 20 um, precincts that, that we'll do, but it's going it, to, it's, it's impact on, on the overall numbers is negligible. We're not going to move any districts that have a significant change in population. It's, most of these are either zero, they're, they're slivers of frontage road or, or they're five to 10 persons, but there won't be anything significant there, but I, I just know if someone kind of started looking at something later and said, hey, I thought that looked a little different, that's basically what's going on there. I think, Kylie, I'm gonna let you wrap that up. Um, I, that's all for us. <laughs> we'll just ask for questions. There you go. Well, thank you, Ms. McIntosh and Mr. Gardner. I appreciate all the work to get us to a finally recommended map. And um, trustees, are there any questions that you all have tonight <laughs> regarding map five in the process? Going once, going twice. All right, looks like you guys are off the hook for the rest of the night. <laughs> Thank so. you. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. We'll see. We'll, we'll see you next time. All right. This ends our section on the information reports from the administration. So at this time, we will now move into the preview of the upcoming regular board agendas. This will allow the public and trustees the opportunity to review the agenda items that will be considered for a vote at the next regular board meeting. AIC staff is available to answer any questions for tonight's preview. We will begin with item seven, which is agenda preview for the upcoming academics and curriculum items. Please note that the administration is pulling item 7.1, approval of innovative course. Trustees, are there any questions on these items? So that would be 7.2, K through 12, human sexuality and responsibility curriculum. 7.3, approval of the Head Start cost of living adjustment and quality improvement funding allocation. 
Uh, and uh, 7.4, alternate school year 22-23 grade seven reading instrument waiver. Trustee Lugo. Yeah, I have a question about um, agenda item 7.2. I'm trying to figure out, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out uh, whether modifications have been made to the curriculum, uh, especially for students who um, are in life skills classes because it crosses ages and also um, what kind of like, what's the status of that? Because I had heard that the modifications haven't been completed. I'll ask Chief uh, Casas to address that question. Yes, and I have online um, Stephanie a bear who's been working on the curriculum. So what we landed on is that there had been a request to modify the curriculum f to make sure that all accommodations and modifications were included. But after much discussion, every student has individualized IEPs. So what we're gonna do is build the toolkit and attach it to the resources so that as a teacher, once they know who the students are that have opted in and they reviews the IEPs, then they can see, do they need to modify? Do they need to accommodate? And then how do they make it specific to the individual students who will participate in the lessons? And will, will that toolkit be available ahead of the school year or how is that being designed? What's the timeline? Yes, it should be available by the fall, mm -hmm, by August. And the, the curriculum won't be taught until I believe November, October, November. Okay, so then the plan is um, the toolkit would be um, uh, completed before the curriculum would even go out to any, any student, is that? Correct. Yeah, the curriculum is already posted online. The toolkit will be posted along with the lessons. Okay. Yes. Um, I think I might have some other questions, but I may submit them through the tracker. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lugo. Any other questions, trustees? All right. Uh, Hearing none, we will move on to uh, the next section, which is item eight, board administration. So that includes 8.1, approval of the audit plan budget, 8.2, nomination for a TASB board position for Region 13A, 8.3, Austin ISD legislative priorities for the 88th legislative session, 8.4, an order of general election for trustee districts one, four, six, seven, and at-large position nine on November 8th, 2022. Mm -hmm. And 8.5, approval of a resolution adopting a final plan balancing the population amongst trustee districts and establishing new boundaries for use in future elections and exercising the option to allow trustees to remain in office to remain, serve the remainder of their term after redistricting. So trustees, any questions on these items? Trustee Lugo. Y'all aren't gonna like me tonight. Um, <laughs> so I have a question about uh, item uh, 8.3, and I'm not sure who would be able to respond to that one, but I was looking at the legislative priorities and um, you know, I've, I've heard that there might be um, other school districts or other school boards interested in um, supporting legislation that would um, kind of bolster or shore up um, partnerships with like gun safety. So like locking up your guns, gun, uh, um, responsible gun ownership type lessons for kiddos. Cause a lot of times um, the things that don't get reported um, are the accidental shootings between young siblings or, um, you know, kids that got a hold of a weapon and so, uh, I, like I said, I, I don't know exactly who would be able to respond to that. Let me do one little piece. Um, so two things. Um, I'll give the, the real-time example right now, Trustee Lugo and other members of the board. Um, the Texas Urban Council of Superintendents, which is the 10 largest school districts in Texas, we will be convening June 21st. Um, and one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to reevaluate our legislative priorities as a team since what occurred in Uvalde. I know that um, several other, like Texas School Alliance, which is 
known as TSA, which is the 43 largest districts in the state, and then the Council of Great City Schools um, nationally, there are 77 school districts. They're all, tr they're all trying to first go back to what their legislative priorities were, because of course we all came up with these prior to that incident. They're <clears throat> now trying to embed some legislation and we are trying to do this collectively. So the Texas Urban Council was the first group that contacted me because I'll be the chair for this coming school year. And I said, I talked to a couple of our members and they said, hold up, we don't wanna do it just as a Texas Urban Council. Let's see if TASA TASB, Texas Urban Council, uh, Mothers Demand Action, like can we make this broader than just schools? Because this isn't a school, it's not a school issue. It manifests itself sometimes in schools. And your point is actually right on with what we heard, I think it was yesterday. Was it yesterday that we had the, the gun violence prevention summit? I think it was yesterday. Well, the city, the county hosted some events <clears throat> and the actual uh, in experts, if you will, that were talking to us there, were talking about the fact that while Uvalde is like what's made us start thinking about this and, and that we should be concerned, at the same time, they actually gave the examples you gave. Accidental, just access to guns or um, access to guns in a heat of a moment that some, so that those, if you actually counted all of those up, the most important statistic is the fact that the CDC now says gun in all forms is the most damaged, is, is the main cause of death amongst adolescents today. So when I thought, when I saw that, it's like, so if drugs, remember we had a whole campaign against drugs, nobody pushed back on that. We're gonna need to unite around that. So certainly that's up to the board on how you all wanna do this, but I know we'd be open to whatever direction you give us. And I know that Trustee Boswell kind of leading this group, we had started with this before Uvalde. Thank you for all of that, Dr. Elizalde, and it's, I'm glad to hear of all the convergence around this. Thank you for that. And Trustee Lugo, I appreciate your question. And um, just want to explain, these legislative priorities are our initial priorities. We wanted to get some funding-related priorities. The committee, um, Intergovernmental Relations Committee, wanted to get some funding-related priorities in front of our board for approval so that we could speak up as the conversation is emerging about vouchers, about recapture, again, about the basic allotment, um, that we would have the authority to speak as trustees on behalf of the board um, in our official capacity about the funding related issues and the plan is to come back in the fall and work with the community to identify further priorities and that I know is one that we're hearing from our community uh, we were hearing it before what happened in Uvalde and we're hearing it even more now so um, absolutely I think that's and then if you recall last month we sent our proposed resolutions to TASB and we sent 20 something and one of them was a safe storage resolution that we proposed to TASB. Again, we had it on there before Uvalde happened, but, but are going, um, moving forward with it and sending it to TASB. And it is very specifically calling for Texas to require DPS under a current safe storage, statewide safe storage program to create materials for public school districts to share with families to inform people about what the safe storage laws are. And in our research for that, we discovered that Houston is already doing a safe storage bay in their registration materials. One of the many, many forms that we all have gotten as parents, one of the forms requires parents to acknowledge that they understand safe storage laws in Texas. And that's something that we could certainly act on as a board if we wanted to, it's something the administration could just choose to do, um, even without board action, and just ask families to to sign safe storage information, just that they're aware of the laws. And I'm happy to share Dr. Elizalde a link to the Houston model. I'm sure you're in touch with the superintendent in Houston who can share that. Um, and I know there are many groups that would be happy to craft documents to save the work from the district to make that available to people if that was something of interest. So. And, and let me add, just to be fair, um, because Dr. Desmar Walks actually reached out last week while we were doing graduations, 
and specifically said she wanted to get together if we were open to doing what what does the edu we know we need to do something and from an education standpoint what does that look like both in terms of communication and then in terms of resources what kinds of tools do people need do they need places to actually lock up the guns do they need places where they need to get rid of guns no questions asked um, and so um, this coming week it's our intention to set up meetings with her to also hear from help from a not being in the health industry that way, I think she could provide us a very different perspective. And then the statistics around adolescents who are injured or killed through just because guns were available at the wrong time, at the wrong place, where someone got angry, someone got sad. Um, and we sometimes don't put suicides in the same area as homicides. And in fact, that's one of the things that the health experts are telling us. We need to stop differentiating as if this is very different. It's still about accessibility mm -hmm. to guns. So first of all, thank, thank you, you so much. I'm so um, grateful. Um, and as you can probably tell tonight, I was like, I'm gonna criticize this, I'm gonna support that. But that's like just genuinely, <laughs> so when, when our district does really great, amazing things that are you know leading edge, um, I will always be amazed and appreciative of that. Um, the other really quick comment, um, first, thank you for raising that CDC statistic because I don't think that that has gotten out to as many people, but my hope is that, you know, that will, um, that more folks will um, be aware of that statistic. And then just in terms of um, access and storage and, you know, all the, all the incidences that um, don't rise to like national media, um, you know, y'all know that I grew up in a household where there was family violence and my dad had a gun locked up and it was always a situation. And I remember one time he brought it out and there was, it was bad, really bad. Um, and so there was always that in the back of my mind, like you just never knew what was going to happen. Um, now on the, like, thank God, um, nothing ever did happen with that. Um, and he did keep it locked because I have older siblings, so you just never know, right? Um, but yeah, I just, it, the issue means a lot. And I just appreciate the effort um, of, of coalescing around this. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lugo. Uh, any trustees, any other questions about agenda item eight? Trustee Anderson? Not really a question, but a comment on the uh, legislative priorities. <coughs> you know, I, yes, we need, we need dollars, but I don't want us to lose sight of the mental health piece. I mean, we, we, we cannot lose sight of that. Like, <laughs> it's needed more than ever. And, you know, as as we are out advocating, please do not forget that piece because it's needed. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Anderson. Trustees, any other questions on item eight? All right, we will now move on to item nine, business and finance, which includes 9.1, adoption of the recommended fiscal year 22-23 budget contract for tree care services. I know someone's dying to talk about that. Approval for a contract for an equity assessment and request for proposals is 9.3. 9.4, approval of contracts for a fine arts and creative learning partnership, phase two. 9.5, interlocal agreement between the city of Austin and Austin Independent School District for social services, namely parent support specialists. 9.6, city of Austin primetime after school enrichment contract. 9.7, City of Austin Victory Tutorial Program Contract. 9.8, Approval of a Clinical Affiliation Agreement with TWU for Student Clinical and Educational Experience for Communication Sciences and Oral Health Students. 9.9, .9, Approval of a Contract for Tutoring Services. 9.10, Approval of an Agreement with the University of Colorado Boulder for Student Clinical Education for Experience for Speech-Language Pathology Students. 
9.11, approval of an affiliation agreement with the University of Akron for clinical education experience for speech language pathology students. 9.12, contract for sustainable rug cleaning services, our other sexy item of the night. Uh, 9.13, approval of a contract for Amazon Web Services. 9.14, approval of a contract for communications and marketing for student enrollment at Austin ISD. 9.15, approval of contracts for translation, interpretation, transcription, and sign language services. 9.16, approval of a contract for a la carte, cereal, and other items for food services. 9.17, contract for placement of insurance coverages. 9.18, AISD authorized broker dealer list of 2022 and 2023. 9.19, monthly financials report for April 22 and final budget amendment report for FY 2021 to 22. Trustee Anderson. Um, that related to the speech language pathologist, just just some, cause I'm always thinking. Do we have any type of program or incentive that would incentivize an individual in the district who wanted to become a speech language pathologist um, to go to school and you know use that training here? I don't think we have anything specifically for that. Uh, what we don't do it, but I will tell you, speech pathologists. Um, if, they, if they can find a way to go get their training, are going to be in very high demand um, and, and, and really do create, um, I mean, obviously they provide a great service, but there aren't enough in the state, there aren't enough uh, across, many of them end up doing a lot of contract work because they can make more money doing contract services as opposed to being an employee of the district, which are some of the things that we're facing during this great resignation across the state and across the nation, but I don't, that is not one that there's a program either that I know of or that we have. Um, I can certainly ask the human capital team to look into it. Um, it is an area of need. I mean, I, I'm just saying, like, we, we have such great opportunities. We have opportunities for students who are ready, set, teach. Like, why can't we do something like that to grow our own? Just saying. I don't know how it works. It just, it just sounded good, so I thought I'd say it. <laughs> it does sound good, and we would love to find a way to do it. So we will we'll, we'll look into it. I mean, if we don't go ask and, and go, you know, make some inquiries, it's probably not going to land in our lap, and maybe it'll also create some other, maybe somebody will think about it and say they'll help us come up with one. So thank you for raising that. Trustee Zapata. I have a question, <clears throat> excuse me, on the parent support specialist item. So do we have full-time parent support specialists at Title I schools? Um, I know, I'm, I'm gonna say, I wanna say we have one at every one of the Title I schools, and I'm getting a confirmation. Yes, every Title I school does have a full-time one. Okay, well that's great. Because I know that they were, they're considered, I mean, they have one school because some are full time, but they have two schools, which is very, very challenging. So it's, a, I guess I need to be more clear. Okay, so let me go back and we can put that in the tracker okay. um, and have it before the voting meeting. And let me clarify that when I say they're full time, that that means they've been assigned one campus. Because yes. it could be possible that if a school is extremely small, that we may have given them two schools, but I don't, I, I hear exactly what you're saying about the challenge, and I still may have had to do that just because of the size of schools in comparison to the number of resources that we have available. But before I do any of that, let me go find out what the facts are. Okay, thank you. Trustee Singh. Thank you all. Um, I was wondering if we are, are we planning on getting a presentation tonight on the budget? Uh, no. I noticed that there was PowerPoint. Okay. So I guess I would, okay. 
I thought that we were going to have one. <laughs> so I will have, I guess I have some questions. Um, would Dr. Elisalde, do you think we could have, um, I guess I, I think attachment four is probably the most comprehensive um, document that's on here. And I, um, I was wondering if uh, maybe um, our CFO might be able to go through some of that with us. I did have a few questions. Um, and before we jump into it, I just wanted to give him and his team a really big shout out um, because of the, <clears throat> I don't know if the public is aware, but we have a one page document for every single campus in our school district. And it's all part of this attachment for in the budget. And it's super helpful if you're interested to see exactly um, how funds are being used on your campus. But, um, but I did have some kind of general questions for, um, for our staff as well. Okay, give me just a second to get uh, Chief Ramos at the table. And then let me see if we can get someone to pull up um, attachment four. I know I want to make sure he has at least at least that Mr. Ramos has been able to pull it up. I'm also pulling it up. I just I can't um, project it. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I think um, Mr. Ramos, you're ready. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I guess um, <clears throat> Ed, could you please share with us, I guess it's starting on page, um, oh, where's the page? It's from last, basically this year to next year. Like what are the biggest changes? Um, it looks like that's basically the first, one of the first pages of the document really. Um, and kind of give us an explanation, not for every single thing, but I would say if there's a change that's more than 25% um, in a category, um, I would be curious to know what that change is. Okay. Or more, I would say more than 20%, um, if, if you wouldn't mind. And you're talking about uh, which, which sheet did you want me to start with? Just okay, that would be starting on page, it looks like on page, um, starting on page four, we can see the budget and you, we can see the variance from, from this year to next gotcha. year. Yes. Yeah. So for example, um, well, I'm gonna break my own rule that I just said, but like student services, like I just wanna get a pretty good understanding of like what it means when I see that there's a 13% less investment in student services. Like what exactly is being cut there? And so I would have to dive into each of those areas because that would depend on potential staffing. Uh, also, that, that could have been part of our 10% uh, non-staffing cuts. Uh, so in looking at if you specifically want anything above a certain percentage point, I can get that summary okay. together and send it in a board update. Okay, okay. And are we gonna have another, and uh, pardon me, I should know this, but um, are we gonna have another hearing or uh, a presentation on this budget so, for the vote, or is that gonna like, help me? Yeah, so on mm -hmm. June 23rd, there is a public meeting where we will present the budget details. Uh, the majority of that presentation will be the PowerPoint that you see before you. And so that will be presented uh, on June 23rd as, far as, as part of the budget approval process. We do that as part of a public meeting before the regular board okay. meeting. Okay. All right. I thought that we were going to have that today, actually. <laughs> so um, typically, we do have a pretty detailed um, presentation at the board info session before the, the actual voting meeting. Um, so I guess... Um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the questions and you can uh, kind of go through. There, are, there is one though that if you have any, if there's any way we can get some indication tonight, I noticed that bilingual education on page five of this 143 page document um, is being cut um, by about 73%. And so is that a result of just like reallocating resources um, or is that, you know, some, services are actually going to be cut in that area. 
So that's probably a real reallocation of resources. Again, I'm gonna have to dive into that specific budget and see if it's partly uh, FTE staffing or part of the regular uh, non-staffing budget. But I can get you those numbers. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Elizade, do you happen to have any information on this? I would have Based less. On, like, I would have less than the CFO would have at this point. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. And then I, the next question would be, okay, so it sounds like you're not going to have, be able to have any explanation <laughs> of these cuts. Um, what are, well, what are the, I, can you just share with us maybe if, what you feel like are the most important things yeah, that you if, would want? If you're talking the about the, the biggest pieces, the, the biggest changes for this budget, you, you will find them in the PowerPoint on slide seven. And that basically okay. talks about the biggest budget uh, investments that we had in the district, and then the biggest uh, budget decreases that we had. And so in looking at investments, we, we did increase our budget uh, by 27.7 million. The majority of that was in compensation. Um, overall, uh, we had 76% uh, of our total budget increases were all directed at compensation. And so you see, uh, when we look at teachers, that's uh, when you look at the $1,000 uh, base pay, uh, and then you look at the uh, two percent of midpoint raise that's a three point seven percent uh, on average raise for our teachers uh, you look at the uh, five hundred dollars uh, five plus uh, a year's retention stipend for all of uh, our uh, uh, veteran teachers uh, counselors librarians uh, then you also mm -hmm. look at um, our can i interrupt you real quick can somebody pull up this slide please as he's going through it it's going to be slide seven. Can you let me know what slide you're on? Slide seven on the on the PowerPoint. It's uh, let me see. The attachment is. Give me one second. I can pull it up. Attachment three. Jacob, it's attachment three. And um, while they're bringing it up, I, I wanted to just ask my fellow trustee, was anybody, was it just me or was there anyone else that was under the impression that we were gonna actually get a, bu a budget presentation tonight? Maybe it was just um, me, I don't know. No, I, I thought that since it had a PowerPoint attachment in board docs that that would be included. I, I thought the same. And we're, okay. yeah, and we're, um, we're following the same budget planning calendar that we followed last year. And so last year there, there was not a uh, presentation as part of the information session. It was done as part of the public meeting on the, uh, the night that you adopted the budget. Okay, I'm probably gonna, I'm wondering if I can request from the administration a trustee small group then, like maybe next week. Um, because I'm, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch this. I really, um, otherwise I would have prepared much better, um, but I'm sure I'm gonna want to kind of go through this fairly closely with, um, with our CFO and any other interested trustees so that if there are issues that we have some time to kind of address those in the budget before the night of the vote. Do you think that might be possible? Um. Do you want the? You want me to answer that first, or you want it? Okay. Um, we have to. Can we look at next week and mm -hmm. and see what we can? Schedule. Um, yeah. We we can work on on seeing what we can schedule for next week, Trustee Singh. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Ed, sorry if you if you don't mind just kind of going through this slide, it would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So as far as the, the overall investments uh, that uh, we placed as a district, uh, again, uh, 27.7 million was specifically in compensation increases. So overall, the additional expenditures that we invested as a district covered 76% 
of our total overall investments. Uh, and that included, again, uh, compensations to our teachers that averaged 3.7% uh, increase uh, when you look at uh, an average midpoint raise. And so that included uh, the $1,000 uh, base pay increase. Uh, it also included uh, the 2% of midpoint. Uh, then you look at our compensation to our classified hourly employees. We raised uh, the minimum uh, wage to $16 an hour. Uh, and that was specifically for our NIS, IS, and our auxiliary pay grades. Uh, that came at a cost of a little uh, eight million. And then we also looked at uh, our bus drivers and bringing their minimum uh, pay to $21 an hour. So that's uh, at a million dollars. Uh, we also looked at uh, increasing our campus per pupil allocation uh, by uh, about 40,000. Uh, we increased our multilingual allocation at our elementary campuses. Uh, that's about uh, at uh, 10,000. Uh, additional physical ed uh, teacher assistance as part of uh, the restructuring, uh, 1.9 wow. million. Uh, the seat and nurse contract was an increase of 1.7. So those are just some of the increases. Uh, as far as the decreases, uh, again, central office and operation budgets uh, took a large uh, impact. Uh, at 27.2 million, so that's 362 uh, actual positions. Uh, the campus budgets from the uh, uh, lower than anticipated enrollment and some of the leveling, uh, $8.3 million in reductions, that was 237 uh, FTEs, those were all vacant uh, uh, positions. And so overall uh, reductions, when we looked at our total budget reductions was 40, almost $48 million. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I do want to point out, Jacob, if you can go to slide five. So when, when you look at our budget and, and you look at our total expenditures, it's going to look like we are actually increasing our overall expenditures as a district, and, and I'm going to explain why. And so last year when we adopted our budget, we adopted our budget uh, at $1.578 billion. Uh, this next year we're looking at $1.681 billion. And so it looks like we're increasing our total expenditures by $102.5 million. So the, the next uh, uh, column to the, to the right basically gives a true picture of what we did as a district. So overall, what it takes to run Austin ISD, we actually cut our overall expenditures by $33.9 million. So when we look at the dollar allocations that we're using to uh, kind of operate the district, we're, we're operating with $33.8 million less compared to what we adopted last year. The increase is all recapture. And so when you look at, we originally budgeted last year, uh, year $709 million in recapture. We now know that estimate is at 761. Next year, mm -hmm. we're estimating $846 million. And so the, the huge increase to our budget is, is all recapture, $136.5 million. So that's the challenge that we face as a district. Uh, we did our best to balance our budget by cutting uh, deeply uh, with our expenditures and how we operate. Uh, but even mm -hmm. then, when you look at our total uh, budget, it looks like we're, we're actually expending more because of recapture. And then, and then slide eight basically summarizes our compensation and, and kind of what we're uh, recommending to the board. And so that uh, just gives a good summary of the different areas that we're looking at as a, as a district. Okay, I really appreciate um, a lot of these investments I see in our staff. Um, that 2000, can you, uh, that $2,000 retention stipend, um, does that apply to, I know we heard um, from some assistant principals today, Are, would they be included in that? That includes all full-time employees that, were, that, will, okay. that will be employed in Austin ISD as of September 1. Okay, yes. great. And then um, the retention, uh, okay, the Reading Academy stipend, thank you very much for that. I know that's something that was really important to a lot of our, our folks. And then related to the PPFT compensation, um, you know, I, th I remember uh, when I first came on the board, when we were um, looking at around the same time we were approving the budget, we would get like sort of this annual like PPFT review. And I was curious to know, um, are we put like, 
are we putting more money, like are our teachers earning more money um, through PPFT, generally speaking, um, than they would if they just, if we had gone through just like a regular, you know, um, year by year increase that was not tied to a PPFT type of program. Do you guys have any um, information on that? Or I know you may not have at this moment, but is that something that we have readily available? Do you all track? We could like, have pull. a PPFT annual report or something like that. We could pull it. Um, and it's going to vary teacher by teacher because there's so many variables involved in PPFT such as okay. did they do a leadership pathway did they do the the pdu credits those kind of pieces so those all add those points are they at an enhanced campus which are our lowest um the, the schools with the highest percentage of economically disadvantaged schools because there's 25 mm -hmm. of those schools and if they're at one of those they get double points so there's a lot of factors that go into that and I know we've sent that so it kind of depends on an individual teacher in terms of what yeah. they're doing within it but we can compare that to like a, a typical what our current typical scale is trustee Singh, okay. can I ask for yeah. a clarification because I'm trying to see if mm -hmm. I can follow where I think you might be going if we were to take like all of the dollars that we're going to pay out in PPFT and we mm -hmm. were to um, then take that amount, whatever that amount is, and we were to say, no, we wouldn't have PPFT, we're going to apply that mm -hmm. to teacher raises, mm -hmm. are you asking like what would the raise look like if instead of using no, PPFT? No, the, I mean, I... I appreciate the attempt, but that's not exactly what I was trying to get to. What? Well, I really wanted to understand if, if the district did any sort of annual kind of PPFT review, like yes. we've done in the past. Yes. And it, whatever that document is, like I don't, you guys don't need to create something new. I am here. I would love to be able to see that and just see how you guys are looking at it, and that might help me understand better just how this is being implemented. But the one thing that I do want, um, I, I would like an answer to, um, prior to the July twenty third vote, is. Um, I have been hearing that, I can't remember what the name of the campuses are, like what those campuses are called, but there are teachers at certain campuses that even if they get the highest score possible on the PPFT, um, they're not able to get the maximum um, compensation or that they could or the, comp the maximum grade that they can on PPFT, which ties to compensation. And so I, I am really curious about that because that does seem like an, like an equity issue. Um, so you might be talking so, about the school value add piece. Um, what we can do is we have yeah. done an analysis of the current end of year evaluations because those are all completed. What I will not have by June 23rd is the conversion of how many points did they earn translated into the dollar amounts because we don't transfer the file over for the next school year That's until fine. after okay. July 1. Okay, but okay. Are, is it true though that they, that because of that value add component, that there are teachers who would not be able to get the maximum PPFT compensation I, even I, if they got the highest possible scores on their observations? So I I'll give you the details, but there there was there is a, a piece on the school value add, and part of that goes back to the fact that we have not had like we didn't have evaluations in 2020 or tests, state tests in 2020. Okay. We had, you know, yeah. part, so, so few students test last year. All of that plays a factor into a school value add, but we gave them a three-year average or a one-year average and used the best of the two. And we do have the statistics okay. to show how many, how many of our schools, you know, did a one-year average and were better off, how many used the three-year average and were better off, and how many schools we had that it didn't matter whether they used the one year or the three year average it would have been the same score okay yeah but we do have some analysis of that yeah i mean i just yeah if there's like a simple answer because i know i don't know if other trustees have been hearing this but i have been hearing this um from a few folks and i would just like a clear response that i could just be like well 
yeah, it is wrapped yes up in no. Like, I don't know if it's true. Like, I would like some confirmation from the district and, you know, just yes. something that I can use to anchor myself and that just those types of discussions. So thank you. We can give you that. Um, and then I'm just looking now through the presentation. Um, I guess, you know, as trustee, like as a trustee, like my, one of my biggest concerns is, you know, that we have enough in reserves. And so I don't know if there's a slide that's related to that, um, Mr. Ramos, but if you have a slide that's related to that and just can, re can remind us like where we are with our reserves and where we need to be, um, just, just to remind us why we're seeing all of these cuts that don't feel very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there is a slide on that. Let me see if I can find it. it I believe it's an attachment four, actually. Jacob, I'm, I'm going to try to make sure you can hear on attachment four. Give us just a second. Yes. Of course. So actually, if you look at the uh, PowerPoint presentation, sli mm -hmm. slide four. Is that three? Yes. So Jacob, go back to attachment three, the PowerPoint I think we were on. And go to slide four, Jacob. And at the very bottom of that slide, you'll see where we are with our uh, unassigned fund balance percentage. Oh, helpful. And okay. so for next year, because of that recapture payment, we will be at 22% is what we are estimating. Okay, and our board policy, it says? 20%. 20, is our, okay, is so our we're minimum. kinda close. Mm -hmm. And then I know so it, one thing that would be helpful for me, I know that, um, you know, with um, when we had Nicole Conley as our CFO, she would give us sort of projections of the fund balance, like, hey, if we continue at this rate, this is how it's going to impact our reserves. Mm -hmm. And we, that was just, we can you pull know, those up. Yeah. We can pull those yeah, up. Like We've that, presented them that to you. That definitely is a reality check um, and allows us to be like, okay, you know, like I think it's really important for us to see this context and looking far out and making sure we're setting up future boards um, We've had for success in, as well. Yeah, we've had that in data in prior it. presentations. We'll pull it up from the yeah. prior presentations that we've put that out because be awesome. we've, we've shown those to you all. Yes. And, um, Okay, I, I do want to reconcile something that you just that you had showed me, Mr. Ramos, on the slide that showed um, the new investment or the you know the change the positive changes in investments. So the multilingual allocation, um, and how, how does like so you may not have this information right now, but when I see like oh okay yay there's you know. This investment in multilingual, um, you know, multilingual programs in our elementary campuses, but then sort of reconciling that with that 72% reduction in, in bilingual education. Like, I want to know how those match up. You know, yeah. like how can you yeah. have an one? One may be a, a department yeah. budget, and then the the one that you're specifically looking at uh, on the PowerPoint is what we gave to the campuses. So those are two different areas, but I can get that information for you. Okay. And I mean, I think that would be helpful because I think I would, I am curious to know um, 
particularly for special education and bilingual education both because they impact so many of our students and they're tied so closely to our scorecard. Um, I would like to get a good understanding of the overall investment mm -hmm. um, in those two programs. Um, and I would say if, you know, particularly special education, I think, because we are under a lot of um, scrutiny on that. And I would, you know, along those lines, could you um, please share with us the changes in special education funding in the district from this year to um, what's being proposed for the budget next year? Yeah, you'll, you'll find uh, some of that data in attachment four. There is a specific uh, page that addresses special ed funding, historical special ed funding. Yeah, I think that was um, page 12, maybe. Yes, uh, page 12 on attachment four. Okay, let me get to that. And if you could, um, if you wouldn't mind kind of talking us through this. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can you please um, just kind of talk us through this page? Yeah, so what that slide shows is historically what we as a district have adopted in our budgets, specifically for total special ed funding uh, out of operating. And so over the years, you'll see the increases year after year. Let's start with uh, fiscal year 2021. Uh, we budgeted uh -huh. 132.1 million. Uh, in fiscal year 23, we were actually budgeting 129.7. Uh, some of that may okay. be because of the special ed numbers. Uh, but as far as what's important is the required state spending, the percentage of state spending mm -hmm. that we must spend as a district based on what our PEAMS reports show uh, is our special ed population. And so by mm -hmm. law, we have to spend at least 55% of what the state says um, our, our state allotment is. And so for okay. us, our state allotment is 65.6 million. So by law, we have to spend 55% of that amount. As a mm -hmm. district, historically, we've spent uh, almost triple that amount. So for next year, we're spent planning to spend 198% of what the state says we should be spending in special ed. Mm -hmm. So we, we do, mm -hmm. as a district, invest in our special ed uh, population and, and our special ed department. Uh, last year, uh, we were at 209%. Uh, the year before that, 194%. So we are spending uh, almost double uh, what the state says our allocation should be, mm -hmm. and then almost uh, four times what they say we should actually be spending by law. Which is probably a pretty arbitrary number. I doubt they are coming up with that amount based on any actual cost. Well, know, I, I would, the <laughs> only thing, the only thing Trustee Singh is, as Chief Ramos is making this, I would align that to uh, Dr. Stetson's report, mm -hmm. which also indicated that in comparison to all other districts, we're way outspending, which is why I think her, part of her observations are about how we're utilizing the funds as opposed to just add more funds uh, to address the concerns that we know we continue exactly. to have. And so yeah, I just no, don't want to, I don't, think, wanna, yeah, I don't no wanna think that, to add, that we're add coming more up. Funds. But I think what I, you know, when I see a cut in funds, you know, I do hope to, you know, I would like to have a pretty detailed idea of what those cuts are and what they're, what they're based on. You know, um, and I'll give you an example. I was talking to a, a special education teacher recently, and he shared with me um, that the district might consider allocating special education staff based on the number of minutes required in IEPs instead of the number of students who have IEPs. Now, I don't know what, my, my recollection was we, we do the initial allocation based on the number of SPED students. Um, but I don't, I guess I'm seeking some, some explanation or confirmation on how, for example, we allocate campus staffing on special education. Is it for students with IEPs or is it by the number of minutes that um, are required cumulatively um, for students? And how is that reflected in this budget? Like, is that how we derived this number? 
so initially when we do our planning from one year to the next it is based on a number of students but the other caveat to that is is as as they look at IEPs there are things that that we add to that staff based on an IEP need or request. We actually use a both and. So first it's a number of students okay. and then it's the specifics in an IEP. So I'll go back to a specific example. If the IEP does call for a teacher assistant as a one-on-one -on -one for that student, you, we're still gonna, you're gonna get the staffing based on the fact that here's a student and there would need to be an additional teacher assistant because that's something that was specifically identified. But remember that all of this is, is not just staffing. Um, so this also includes other expenditures. Well, let's stay on the staffing. Let's stay on the staffing for a minute because I want to. I appreciate that explanation. Okay, so that's a good example of how you might add a, a whole nother staff person because it says that this child, you know, really does require someone by their side all day. That's pretty clear. What if you have like five kids at one camp, you know, the same number of kids at two campuses, they're not requiring a special, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, aid by their side, but they might have a variance in the number of minutes. Let's say the kids at this school only need, you know, X number of minutes and this group has like, you know, Y number of minutes. Um, none of none of the IEPs would, are calling for an additional aid. Um, are those two campuses going to get the same number of special education staff allocated to them, even even if they have a different number of minutes of required um, services? So for the most part, the and I and I'm speaking not specifically about Austin. And Elizabeth may have to answer this one, but generally when you sit in an ARD meeting and you have those conversations, there's pretty much a standard such as if if my own child was in need of um, special education services for a third grade classroom in mathematics, that there's a pretty standard set of required minutes that we would put in there. So that would be the case for any third grader for math and fourth grader and fifth grader. So the standardization of service minutes Correct is yes. done initially. So it truly comes down to what services are being required, you know, for different students, but it's also their setting. So if you have students who are in a regular classroom and someone's coming into the classroom, then it also depends on how you're, you're placing students in those grade sure. levels. When I was a yeah, third so grade, I'm just, yeah. I think I'm, I, I understand that. I'm just saying, like all things being equal, I'm then not they would really have the same number hearing of staff. the answer. Like, would they get the same number of staff if you had two groups of kids, same number of kids, but different numbers of minutes, and everything else is equal? It depends. <laughs> it depends on how many minutes you're talking about. Like. I can't say if one's requiring 30 and one's requiring 45, you would give different staff because that one staff member in both cases could provide coverage for those five kids. Now, if one student requires six hours and the other four require four hours, then you couldn't have one staff member do it because they physically couldn't provide that service. So is there a mechanism that you guys use after you do your first pass where you're just assigning staff based on numbers of students and after you've taken care of the students who IEPs clearly say they need one-on-one -on -one help? Okay, and then beyond that, are you guys going through and doing that differentiation? So, so there is someone in the special education department that looks specifically at the staffing at every single campus. Like last spring, they went to every single campus to talk to principals and identify the, the personnel that were on that campus because we did not have an accurate count. So last spring, we okay. got an accurate count. We did an initial placement this year. As, the, as things happen during the year or if there is a need on campus, they come back to us and request additional personnel for different schools. And so okay. we do that throughout uh, the year based on need, but then it's once again starting over to make sure that like we haven't moved people into some other position and still have them on a special education okay. staffing chart. Okay, yes. that's helpful. Okay. And then so I'm assuming like this, this um, reduction 
um, from this year to next year in special education. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that's based on, you know, recommendations from Stetson, um, you know, strategic plan, our scorecard goals, our panorama data. You know, we have a lot of data sources now um, that we didn't have this time last year. And so, you know, we have all the board monitoring reports we've been doing where we've been looking at SPED, looking at eco disc versus non eco disc, even within special education. So, are you like, have you guys? use all of that to come up with this number? And if so, like, is there a plan that goes along with this? I'm not asking it for every single thing that we're doing in the district, but specifically for special education, because that has been such a, you know, um, flashpoint, you know, in, in our district in an area of, of need and scrutiny. So trustee seeing if you look at the chart, there's a difference between the amount budgeted and then what was actually spent. So mm -hmm. last year we budgeted 137 million, but we actually spent 90 million. And so the reduction from 137 to 129 for the next fiscal year should still cover expenditures. And, and that's as of April. So we still haven't finished adding all of the expenditures for the 21-22 school year. So does that make sense? There's still a bit of a cushion in yeah, there. Yeah, no, I understand yeah. that, but I, I, I'm still, I guess, needing an answer to the question, which is how did we come up with this one? Like, is that, what is that? Is that tied to all of these recommendations that we've received and, you know, the scorecard data? Like, is there, is there a strategy on which this is based? Um, that we can see so you know because if i'm if i'm supposed to vote on this i need to feel pretty comfortable that this this, this budget amount is going to get us where we need to be with our scorecard uh, measures but if, if i don't have that documentation or explanation um, it's a little harder for me to just believe it and be like okay especially given the state of our um special education, you know, looking at the data, the outcome data and the implementation data. So, so, so. The, base, the baseline that we start with is, is our PEAMS numbers and, and just our overall special ed numbers. And so when you look at fiscal year 22, uh, the adopted budget, that was based on an assumption. Uh, and so for fiscal year 23, we have better numbers because of what we've seen uh, this year mm -hmm. in, in fiscal year 22. And so that is kind of what, what we base it on as far as our overall PEAMS numbers. We look at staffing. And so once we combine those two, uh, then we, we come up with the overall budget. If you remember last year, uh, we- It's based on PEAMS numbers and it's based on staffing. PEAMS numbers, staffing, services that the students need uh, that we've seen this okay. year. And so, I mean, there, there's and several factors. is there factors. an actual strategy? So I, get, I mean, I'm not hearing that, yes, Arthi, mm -hmm. this is based on, you know, the recommendations from Stetson, and this is based on, you know, our um, our results that we've gotten this year. It sounds like you're not there yet for no, whatever reason. Yeah, I just need to know, like, do we is does that does that document? <laughs> Trustee exist? Singh, I'll do go ahead. I'll I'll go ahead and um, <laughs> there is a strategy, and um, you know, I think um, the idea that we are not planning. This comes from the services that the students are, um, that are, that are prescribed, and then those are mm -hmm. aggregated up, and then we begin. That's the place we start is from what the PEAMS numbers are in terms of numbers, and then throughout this entire process, throughout these several months, it has been an adjustment based on reviewing what campus needs are giving allocations, having dialogue with campuses, campuses giving feedback, looking at data that came from Dr. Stetson, looking at information we obtained from the TEA visit, looking at a review of special ed folders, um, and combining all of that together to create what we think is what we need based on what we're projecting. Then as the school year begins, we'll have to make additional adjustments based on where the students show up 
you know, we may be planning for a certain number and we may have that number, but they may not be showing up at the campuses where we've assigned staff. Um, mm -hmm. Are they, did we end up where students are placed um, based on Dr. Stetson's re re yeah. um, recommendations about how many students in each classroom should be reflective of the population that are being served that are special education. So you don't want to have generally, you know, 20% of a classroom is probably the maximum limits you want in any given classroom. So even if I did have 10 third graders, I don't want all 10 third graders that are receiving special ed to be in one classroom mm -hmm. of 20. So that means we have to adjust how many staff members we're going to need. I can't tell you right now from a scientific standpoint where those students are going to show up and whether the plan we put together is perfect or or not it'll have to be based I, I on whether looking. we're organizing all of the items together yeah. and so um that that's our that's our best response at this time so i think um i'll just be really clear that this 137 thousand 137 million and the 129 million both of those were based on a bunch of other numbers right you didn't i know you didn't just pull it out of the air it's based on staff equipment you know all sorts of things materials and so i think i would like i would feel comfortable seeing an itemized budget from you know the you know past school year versus next school year so i can see like which line items within the sped budget has changed and then that might be a good starting point for you then to share oh yeah this you know you're going to see a reduction in in you know this area because the stetson report shared this thing with us and this is how it plays out into the numbers and um, that, that's the kind of conversation because ultimately, um, you know, anytime TEA is scrutinizing um, our school district on something, I feel like, you know, we have to pay as, as a trustee, I feel, I'm not gonna speak for my colleagues, but I feel I have to really be on top of it because I don't wanna be in a situation two years from now and people are like, well, who was in charge of this? Why didn't anyone ask the questions? So that's the only reason I'm doing this. It's, you know, I know that you guys want this to be as successful as I do. Um, and, um, but that that's, you know, that is the burden that I feel of, of, of having a deep understanding, particularly in special education. So I hope that that does come across. Um, the other question is, um, I do recall, in the past, um, I, one of the new terms I learned when I first became a trustee was the concept of maintenance of effort um, when it comes to special education. And so I would be curious to know like how um, a reduction like this conforms with our responsibility of maintenance of effort with special education. I don't know if that's something that uh, you can help me understand. So every year we actually have to uh, do a calculation to make sure that we are in compliance with the maintenance of effort. And so again, this the, the numbers that you see before you, they're a planning tool, uh, but when adjustments need to be made during the year, especially if we need to, to meet the, the maintenance of effort requirement, then those adjustments are made. A good example is that back in 2017, uh, you look at our adopted budget uh, in that year, it was 90.1 million. Uh, by the time the end of the year uh, came and, and we looked at our actuals, uh, we were at 93.6 million. So something happened uh, in that year to increase our special ed uh, spending, which was probably the number of students we had, the services that they needed. So this, again, the budget is just a planning tool to get us where we need to be. Uh, but but uh -huh. there are different matrix that we look at throughout the year to make sure that we are in compliance, especially with the maintenance uh -huh. of effort calculation. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm gonna take a little break because um, I, I do have a few more questions, but I would like to give an opportunity for my colleagues to speak if they have any questions about the budget. Yeah, and, and if not, I'll keep going. But. <laughs> Trustee Anderson's had her hand up. Bef before I call you Trustee Anderson, though, I just wanted to clarify, though, that in in the out of respect for our, Mr. Ramos and our administration that we never did have this item as a agenda item on our in any of our governance meetings and so um, it always has been part of our agenda preview um, and that's something that's new this year versus last year so I think it may be creating a little bit of confusion in that typically we wouldn't get this um, 
documentation that we have before us tonight that we've been reviewing until maybe three to five days prior to the voting meeting. But because we have updated our um, information sessions to have an agenda preview two weeks prior, we do have the benefits of, and thank you to our administration for being able to speed up and give us this documentation two weeks prior to our voting meeting so that we do have time to review it and prepare questions. So, so I just wanted to clarify that we were, there was never an intention to have a presentation tonight, but the intention is for us to be able to review the documentation that we were given in advance of our voting meeting when we normally would have it presented. So I appreciate all of the, the questions and I appreciate all of the responses that we've been getting. I think it's a great discussion. So with that, uh, Trustee Anderson. So <clears throat> when I first received my binder, I, I really wanted to hit the ceiling because I really think at this point, my concern is being ignored and it's really ticking me off. So I keep hearing equity, 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 equity. What is equitable about this thick binder that you think people gonna stay up to one, two, three o'clock in the morning to hear presentations like, these are things the secretary is supposed to be looking at. And I don't like to be in the middle of an agenda. I don't like that. I don't, I, I'm not here to play games, I'm not. So if you think what's coming on the 23rd is going to be equitable, you need to rethink it. We keep talking about communication and transparency. How is it? Tra it's 1056. Did you really think we were going to get a budget presentation? Really? That would have been that knowing the bulk of us would have ran well over two or three hours. Who, what, what community is up this late to hear a budget presentation? And the fact that you said you didn't know. Point of order. I, I, this has to do with this. This is what I'm talking about. I didn't interrupt you. This is what I'm talking about. It is not transparency when we get in a binder this thick and expecting our community to hear presentations and they can't hear it because it's 11, 12, 1, 2, and 3 o'clock in the morning. Where's the, where's the transparency at? Please tell me that. Trustee Anderson, we have a point of order from Trustee Lugo. I'm sorry. I, I understand the, um, given the, the history of what has previously been discussed in um, closed session um, where the frustration is coming from. But I also think, is there a way for us to get back on track? We may want to close this particular conversation right now and save this one for executive session, which we can reconvene about that in a little while and move back to the agenda preview for the moment if the rest of the trustees are in agreement with that approach. Okay. Um, so with that, are there any other um, questions, trustees, for um, section nine? Trustee Boswell. Um, about the budget as well, thank you. Um, I will try to keep it short. Uh, I would appreciate a, the opportunity for a small group, so thank you for looking for time for that next week. And I think, uh, I know we had seen um, the general fund increases and decreases slide before, and I appreciate that, but I also see some things there that um, when we look at the the document, and thank you also for the, the um, campus by campus breakdown. I think that's a valuable new addition with transparency, um, but I still think the overall budget, I, I feel like we're getting thinner information than we've gotten in the past, and it's not that I doubt that the work's been done, but I don't feel like the work's been shown um, in a way that makes me confident yet. And I think, you know, if we're looking at things like a $5 million reduction in career and technical education, for example, when we've added that um, in a new way and an amplified way to our scorecard, you know, I would just love a better understanding before we vote about how, you know, $20 million less for um, 
instruction? Does that reflect our decline in enrollment? Kind of what is what are we seeing and how do these choices serve students? I understand um, the fiscal stewardship bit and I know this is a major achievement to get to a balanced budget to protect our fund balance. I don't want to discount that, but I also know that we're facing some really difficult cuts. And before um, speaking for myself, before I vote for this, I really need to understand the impact you expect the cuts to have on students and kind of how they've come. You know, the $3 million less for dyslexia, you know, $6 million less, $6.5 million less for bilingual education kind of what are we seeing before I'm comfortable voting? So I think some of that can be taken care of in small group, and I hope, um, I know our community has some of the same questions I have, and so I hope some of that will be taken care of at our hearing as well. Um, thank you. Trustees, any other questions? Trustee Lugo. <laughs> um, for the uh, voting meeting on the 23rd, will we then get um, a brief presentation about agenda item 9.3, the equity assessment, just to like high level recap, since we're saying that we don't use the information session to do the presentations? Or like a one pager or something. I know there's information, there's a lot of documents mm -hmm. attached to that agenda item. Yeah. And I looked at the equity page too, the website. Um, so I don't know if that's something that could be addressed. I'll talk to our team and um, see about the possibility of, of. So you're requesting a presentation on the 23rd? No, I was asking if there was plans for a presentation and if there's not. There was not. Um, if there's not, then um, when I was looking at the equity um, page on the AISD website, I couldn't find, not that it's not there, but I couldn't find like just a quick explanation of, you know, how did we get to the um, uh, equity audit? our equity assessment. Um, and there are a lot of attachments in board docs. And so I'm just thinking for somebody who wants to get like a quick, like cliff notes version. So let me go back to our board updates on the timeline that we put together. I think we have a one pager on that um, from a previous board update. And I'll go back and see if we can um, resend that out this next board update and see if that would meet the needs of what you're looking for. Yeah, or and if it's available publicly, I mean, that would be amazing to have it available for the public. Thank you. All right, well, I just had one question to add to the mix, um, and I think it's probably from Ms. Stevens. Um, I know that we've been getting a lot of questions about different employee classes and pay increases, and my understanding is that while some pay increases are coming forward, um, including midpoint changes and other things um, are coming forward with this budget that other employee classes may see those increases or those changes in subsequent budgets, but it wouldn't be something that we could shoulder in one year, that it would have to be something that's rolled out over multiple years. That is correct. So um, the, the one particular, I mean, I can talk about three particular groups. Our administrative, the police department, and IT groups are not included in any raises this year. Um, overall, any adjustments to those would be anywhere between four and four and a half million. And so we just don't have that much mm -hmm. remaining to do that. So what we'll do is when we do our planning for next year, those will be the first three groups that we look at. And so it's, it's that kind of piece so that we can just maintain the fiscal responsibility that you've all mm -hmm. want for your balanced budget. Appreciate that. And I think the reason I ask is because we're getting a lot of um, really compelling uh, asks, particularly about assistant principals and the, the, the fact that their pay differential is not significantly greater commensurate with the level of responsibility that they're taking on versus a classroom teacher. And so, I just I want to make sure that it's clear for those groups that they haven't been forgotten about. It just may be that we can't do everything this year, but it could be next year or the year after that that would happen. That is correct. And if you remember last year, you as a board approved the whole AP structure. So last year, we took the whole AP structure 
did the increase, but we also decompressed that whole scale. So there were significant changes from last year to this year with those those employees. So yes, but we can put some things together for you so you have some talking points. That'd be wonderful. Or even if that's something that's included as an extra attachment within the agenda, within the, the budget packet, I think that would be helpful just to have a company that so that folks are aware. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, with that, trustees, um, our next section is section 10, and this one's gonna be super hard because we have no items under this section. Um, so moving on to section 11, uh, community engagement, uh, which includes 11.1, uh, uh, the naming of a new middle school in Northeast Austin, namely the Mueller Middle School. 11.2, uh, and I shouldn't say Mueller, I apologize for that. Um, the middle school that is located in Mueller, so um, the Northeast Middle School. Um, and 11.2, naming of the Sanchez Elementary Library. Trustees, any questions on these two items? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to section 12, human resources, which includes 12.1, a consultation agreement on employee compensation, 12.2, proposed termination of a professional employee, uh, 12.3, another uh, proposed termination, 12.4, consideration of the arguments of the parties in the independent hearing, uh, listed below. Uh, trustees, any questions on these items? Hmm. All right, our next section is section 13, policy. Uh, trustees, please note that one item on here is not currently scheduled for action on June 23rd, which is item 13.3, DC local employment practices. Um, this, uh, the board may choose to discuss this item as part of the superintendent transition tonight, but uh, trustees, are there any questions on the following items? 13.1, BE local regarding board meetings. 13.2, BED local regarding board meetings and public participation. 13.3, DC local employment practice, or sorry, that was the one we were skipping. 13.4, EHAA local basic instructional program required instruction. 13.5, DCD local employment practices and at will employment. 13.6, DEA local compensation and benefits and compensation plan. 13.7, DFE local termination of employment and resignation. 13.8, 22-23 student code of conduct or um, as we were calling it earlier, now I'm gonna forget the name, uh, Student Success Plan, <laughs> and 13.9, uh, Summer Work Schedule Waiver. Trustees, any questions on these items? All I would right. like, if I could, just to highlight 13.9, because this is, um, you did this for employees last year, and I, we actually started the schedule, so we're actually asking for permission after we have already started it. But um, it was very um, supported by you as a board last year. And so as a reminder, to go to four-day work weeks would require employees to have to work 10-hour days in four days as opposed to their eight hours over five days. So 10 hours is a lot particularly for individuals that may have to drop off children or, or pick up children, daycare, and so on. So that extra 30 minutes, what we proposed that you approved last year was nine and a half hours, as opposed to 10, which means technically it's 38 hours as opposed to 40. And we did get legal um, ruling or a uh, legal opinion that we could ask you all to waive those two hours per week so that staff would still get paid for 40 hours, and they're technically working 38, but they're doing that in four days, and that really does allow our staff, particularly in the summer, to have a little bit of a, a, a place to kind of recharge for three day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, before they come back. Um, and as you all know, the employees work very, very hard. So. I just want to highlight it. We really, I really should have, I should have really put this on there last month. Um, but I do have, um, while, while we may not be in alignment in many things this evening, I think we're in alignment that we want to make sure our employees uh, are able to and really not have to do those 10 hour days in the summer. So that's what this will be. Thank you, Dr. Elizalde. Uh, Trustees, any questions on section 13? 
All right, well, this will, uh, um, section 14, we do not have any items into that section as well. Um, so this will end our regular agenda preview and, um, and uh, we will now end our open session and reconvene an executive session. Is there any language I need for the? Thank you. Uh, we will now recess the open meeting at 11.09 p.m. and move to executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551, 551.074, 551.072, 551.073, 551.087, 551.076, and 551.071. For our viewers at home, this concludes our live broadcast. When we are finished with the executive session, we will briefly return to open session to formally adjourn the meeting. This adjournment will be recorded and will be included in all replays of tonight's meeting. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening.